AO International new agent onboarding class, 23-16. Let's see if we can't nail it. How are we doing this morning? Fantastic. Fantastic, Sam. How are you doing? Thank you. That's much better. I really appreciate that because we need to get the day going. We need to get the, you know, the, the juices flowing, all that good stuff, right? I have a lot of stuff I have to do today, not the least of which is spend quality time with all of you. All right. Barbara Wambacher, did you work with your hierarchy yesterday? Uh, no, I just did the classes. I haven't worked with um, Nicola yet. No. Okay, you're killing me. Did you do the I, phone thing yesterday? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I did the okay. afternoon phone thing, and I watched on the phone. I'll um, send him a All text right. during our lunch break and wait, ask him wait, if he's got wait. a little time. Slow down. If you worked with your phone training in Dushai, then you in fact work with your hierarchy. That's what they okay. have you. Do, right? Are you okay. script based? Yes. Congratulations. So you released a dial. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm not. They haven't officially released me yet, but I have it all memorized and did really You're well yesterday. Me, Barbara. Killing me this morning. You're absolutely killing me. So I'm going to move off of you because obviously you want to mess with me. We're going to go to that person <laughs> who stares at me in the camera and I just feel, I feel like, why do I have to spend any time with you? Rebecca Rice, <laughs> that is you because this is you. You're just looking at me. Hold on. Let me do this. Sorry. <laughs> and then when you blink, it's like, oh my gosh. No, I'm just kidding. All right, Rebecca, come on. Did you work with your hierarchy yesterday? Um, I did phone training, yes. Yeah, we got it right. That's awesome. Are you script released? Not yet. Okay, so when are you gonna do that? Today? Um, hopefully. It's the rebuttals that keep getting me. Yeah, it's the rebuttals. Okay. So do you have them right there in front of you or do they make you memorize it? I forget what they have you do. No, I have them in front of me. Mm -hmm. But it's the um it's the off script ones that that get me <laughs> flustered. The ones that throw you. Okay, no worries. Hey, does somebody have the DRB report link? Does somebody have that where they submitted it? Yes. Melissa, can you put that in the chat for everybody? Yep. My system is giving me some fits this morning as usual so i've got to work through that brooke pickett brooke i only see one of you so i am very confused i don't know what is going on uh, i just i'm getting there i was about to pull up the zoom on the computer <laughs> oh, i started i got faster internet but yay. the computer still when i got in my zoom call with my um managers yesterday it was still just not working right but I have another computer to try to see that I got off Amazon. So well, there you go. So, I mean, we're going to get there. By the time you meet with clients, you'll have it all figured out. Did you have a chance to work with your hierarchy yesterday? Yes. Okay. It's like everyone forgets week one. So when I ask that, if the answer is yes, you're supposed to tell me who your hierarchy is. What did you do? Oh, so it was Torian, Bobby. <laughs> and I watched like three presentations. I think it was actually two presentations. Oh my goodness. Did you watch Torian? I did. I watched Torian do two. And did he sell those two? No. One of them, the guy couldn't, he could, he was like a, it was like a half presentation because he was automatically, he was like disabled. So. Okay. So he wasn't, he didn't qualify. Okay. Yeah. And then the yeah. second one, he sold it this morning. The second one. He actually did get back on the phone with them because they weren't at their actual house. They were moving from one house to the other uh -huh. and all their prescriptions were in the other house. And mm -hmm. the guy said that he needed to talk to his wife who was right there, but he was like, we're definitely probably going to do this, but. How much was the plan that they purchased? Um, I think it was 182. So, so if it was, you had sold that, what would you have made? Um, like six. I'm I'm not sure. I got it. So can you calculate it for me? Yes, I All can. Right. You're awesome because I'm going to do it too. That gives me a number. That gives me another number, and that gives me a final number. So I think I know how much you would have made. Well, I don't know where my calculator is on my computer. <laughs> Here oh we my go. Goodness. What What are we going to do with you? Well, so, no, no, you know, I use calculate. a calculator on the phone usually, but what it's right here. 
I got it. My phone's this. I'm talking to you Come on the phone. All so right, go ahead. Two, 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 I got it. I got it right here. And? And it is about $900. $1,092. Okay, you think it's $1,092. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I got to divide it by 75%. So, hold on. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. That was about like 600 or something. So, Brooke, I get the sense you have no idea. Am I no, right? I don't have no, uh, no idea, but it gave me the opposite. It gave me $1,400. <laughs> All right, we're going to do this together because I'm now getting scared. I don't know what's going on. So how much was it per month? How much was it per month? $182. $182. We're going to multiply that times 12. That means the ALP was 2184 correct? I got that. Um, you get credit of 50% for that. So your credit is 1,092 and we're gonna advance you 75% of that. So I get 819. Brooke? Yeah. Starting to scare me. Do you get 819? Um, yes. See, Brooke, now I know you're just saying that to make me move on to somebody else, <laughs> right? Because why, do you not multiply it by 0. 0.75? Is that not how you do it? Yeah, so, okay, you take 182, you multiply that times 12, right? We agree, 2,184, right? Yeah. And then you get 50% credit of that. So you're going to multiply that times 0. 0.5, which gets you 1,092, correct? Yeah. And then you're going to multiply that times 0. 0.75. And that gets you 819. Right? That's literally what I did. And did you get 819? I did this time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live in Brooks World. I don't know. I'm math sorry. changes depending on what you do it. I hey, just told you that's what you do. Twice. I don't know why it didn't. I don't know, Brooke. I don't know. In your world, it's like the math changes all the time. It's fine. Don't worry about it. No, that's not true. You, so you watched a couple of presentations. Do you remember how many referrals he got? He got a lot. It was probably like eight. You know what? The other guy didn't talk much about any referrals. How but... come I get this sense? You're just making it up as you go. You're like, oh, he got yeah, eight. Uh, I would have got paid two thousand. I mean, you're just kind of throwing numbers out there, right? No, I'm not making it up. It's just that he had a lot of names, so I had to Why? guess. Oh my goodness. Okay, no worries, Jason. I didn't count the money, though. We're gonna give Brooke a break because she's making me laugh way too much this morning. Jason, did you get a chance to work with your hierarchy yesterday? No, my upline is in Europe, uh, but I have my rubric scheduled for tonight after the class. Who is your upline? I forget. You told me he was on vacation. Donnie right? Nevzadi. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, then you're going to get your rubric done and out of the way. That is awesome. So who else should I ask? Somebody had to work with their upline yesterday. Is it going to be you, Lisa, who looks like she's in a dungeon? You, Lisa, what is going on with your lighting? Every time I see you, it gets darker. I'm sorry. I really like my house dark. No, Everyone I says they come in here and it just takes their energy away. But I feel like the light just okay. but I'm gonna have it on when I do presentations for sure. <laughs> so basically you're a vampire. <laughs> when you're ready to do a presentation, you'll look like my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come talk to me. I'm help you with your insurance. Okay. Did you work with your upline yesterday or your hierarchy? I wasn't or able or? to. I had to take my baby to a, the doctor. Oh my gosh, she okay? Are he okay? Or? Yeah, he's fine. He just he oh, had okay. rashes. The doctor said it was perfectly normal. Yeah. How old and is he? I was uh, so scared. What? It's my first baby, so anything gets totally me scared. Understand. How how old is he? He's six months. Oh, I totally get it. Yeah. I think uh, Melissa and I, I'm trying to look at this class. We're probably some of the oldest, right? Our, you have kids, right, Melissa? 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 Oh, my yes, God. Yes, he's 18. 
All right, right. So mine are 30, right? So we remember those days. So you're going to be fine. You're going to get through it just fine. Okay. When, when you have your second one, you won't believe how different it is that from the first one, because the first one you're like all over them, like, oh, be careful. Don't do this. Don't do that. I got to bring them to the doctors. When you get the second one, oh, that's all right. I'll get to it later. <laughs> oh, yeah. And when he's sleeping, I have to like constantly go check or I constantly get my boyfriend to go check on him. And uh. Uh, it'll, it'll get easier. Trust me. It'll get fine. Look at Kristalina, my newest agent's bouncing on her knee. I love it. Kristalina, can you hear me? What is it with this class? Everyone's like, I can hear you. Oh, you can. You just ignore me. Okay. Who is no, that? What, what's the name? What uh, this is, is Josiah. Uh, well, oh, my gosh. All right, Ulyssa. I mean, you sorry. Said what? <laughs> the name is what? <laughs> His name is Josiah. Josiah. Okay. Hi, Josiah. Everyone wave to Josiah. See if he can see us. Josiah, we're all waving at you. He's like clapping. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, guys. All right. Uh, that's great. So we've got Elisa. we got a little Josiah in there. And uh, Adam Bendel's feeling left out. He's like, well, what, why am I not getting the call now? Uh, Adam, I'm going to continue to skip you. Faith Webb, did you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Faith Webb, what is the one thing you know about me I haven't told you? One thing I know about you that you haven't told me. Mm -hmm. um, you can't look at my background, my picture, my visage anymore because we've exhausted that. Yeah. The seven I, 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 days we were together, what have you learned about me? Um, I mean, everyone's cart kind of already picked you. You asked the question a lot. <laughs> right, because I want you to make that a habit that you're picking up information about people. So what is the one thing that you feel you know about me that I haven't told you? That you're always happy. Okay. I'm always happy. Oh, little do you know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So please fill out the DRB report because I can't see it. I can't pull up the submission. So I'm hoping against hope that you all are actually doing Actually, if you fill out the DRB report and received an email back, raise your hand electronically and leave it up. Then this way I know when people have done it. Maybe that's what I should start doing every time. I make my, uh, Heidi is sick. I'm sorry, Heidi. All right, we got Melissa, we got Absham, Mike, Eric. Barbara Wombacker, you haven't finished it yet? You're telling no, us I, about I, your I first more? Well, I, where's your I, hand? Wait a second. Billy. Was, Millie, uh, Millie. Sorry, I was checking to make sure that I got it back. It's okay. That's all. It's okay. It's, it's, you're fine. Also for the kids <laughs> what, what was that i said i'm working on it now i was making breakfast for the kiddos oh okay no worries so who's uh, you guys have to leave your hands up i can't tell who's not done yet uh christian you did it right christian christian just give me a thumbs up if you've done it since i can't hear you you can't hear me oh i'm Literally just got it, so I was okay. uh, still in. All right, cool. If you can do it, that'd be great. Ulyssa, yeah, it looks like you're doing it. Will, <laughs> Will, <laughs> Will, have you finished it? Will, uh, I didn't see it until just until it was just sent on the chat, and I uh, if it was sent earlier, I don't know. I was disconnected. No, don't worry about it. If you can do it now, that would be great. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, Virginia, have you submitted your DRB? I'm thinking that means no. So can somebody put it back in the chat for her again? It's in it like six times. I know, but when you come in late, you don't see the chat from before. Oh, shit. I didn't know. Ben, Ben, come on. Sorry. I'm recording this. <laughs> Stop. Ben. ben, give me the real, real. <laughs> okay, Ben. All right. So what are we doing today? We're going to go back into EAP, but I thought it might be constructive to rewatch just the part of EAP or the Ashley Rust video, but only the part about EAP. So I sent you the link, you can all get there, and I sent you the link for yesterday's video in general. So we're gonna take a minute and we're gonna watch that video together. You guys can all put your hands down, that'd be great. So let me, let me see what I can do here. Hold on one second, let's go to the videos. 
Oh, there it is. So we're going to pick up Ashley Rust as she finishes with her clients with EAP. Adam, your hand is still up. Does that mean you have a question? Does that mean you forgot? Are you frustrated I didn't call on you? Adam, did you get a chance to work with your upline yesterday? Thank you for including me. Uh, <laughs> I did, yes. My yeah. upline, thank you. And we did uh, a lot of phone calls. We did a lot of dials. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got an appointment scheduled for the evening. So I finished the evening off watching a, a presentation. Oh, nice. Good for you. And the presentation, did they sell it? Uh. It went to a trial, but yes. So it still needs to go underwriting, but they did get all the information, did the DocuSign, all the fun stuff. So, how much? No, I forget that because it's a trial. So you're not going to get paid on it until the trial completes, right? We talked about that. However, how many referrals did they collect? Uh, he got seven or eight. So let's say he got eight. So let's do the math for everybody really quickly. I just want you to all be aware of what the deal is. So you have eight referrals. Typically, we get in contact with at least 60% of those referrals. So if I say eight times 0.6, that's four. So let's say it's five people I get in contact with and I have the presentation with. Referrals close at at least 50%. So there's five, 50% would be 2.5. Let's just go lower and say it's two, okay, just to be conservative. The average ALP for a referral is 1,500. So that means you're going to multiply 1500 times two for the two sales that gives you $3,000. Then you multiply that times 0.5 and then times 0.75. So that's $1,125. So those eight referrals will turn into over a thousand dollars of income for you. And you didn't have to wait for us to give you a lead or anything like that. Those are your leads. You control those, right? Yep. So that's why referrals in my mind, <laughs> in my mind, from my perspective, the number one job on a presentation is to get sponsorships because you're not going to close at 100% of the time, right? You're not going to go into EAP 100% of the time. So you need to do the entire presentation, make sure they see value. But it's for you personally, it's absolutely crucial to get those sponsorships because you're going to make money off them because they close. Yep. And they close at a pretty high level, okay? All right, so I'm going to play this video. We'll watch it. And then on the other side, we will jump back into EAP. But I just wanted to refresh everybody kind of what she does, how she does it, and what it looks like from the client's perspective. So let me go to share my screen. And here we go. Is it showing on your end? It is, yep. I got you. Not yet. Perfect. I didn't see if I didn't put my number in my mind. All right. Oh my goodness, these dogs. All right, all right, I'm going to start with yours first. Yep. Can you tell me your birthday one more time? 61480. Right, and what state were you born in, Art? I was born in Pennsylvania. Okay, so what's that? And then for Nana. Well, 120s. 12688. Okay. Right. And you were born in Jersey? New Jersey, yep. And then um, we'll go ahead and list the kiddos on here too, since they're all covered. What's the oldest one's name? Adelaide, A D E L A I D E. Oh, say that one more time. A D E L A I D E. That's so pretty. I love it. And when is her birthday? Uh, four twenty one seventeen, and she was born in Pennsylvania. Yes. Okay. And the next one, Everett, E V E, uh, R E T T, <laughs> E V E R E T T. Right. Yep. Yes. 
And then when is his birthday? Uh, 8 one nineteen. And Pennsylvania as well? Yes. The real question, Art, is do you know all these birthdays? I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good for you. Most of the husbands have to leave it up to the wife. <laughs> all right. And the last one is? Henry. Henry. H-E-N-R-Y. When is Henry's birthday? Uh, 7 21 and Pennsylvania, right? Yes. All right. Now the fun part would be everybody's height and weight. So Art, I'm gonna start with you. What's your height? Uh, 5'10". All right. Uh, 170, give or take. Sweet. All right. And then Brianna, what's your height? 5'4". Uh, and your weight? Uh, about 145 right now. Okay. And then I know, yes, the kiddos, we got to put them on here just as close as you okay. can get it for them. What's um, um, I can actually pull up their charts oh, on there. Um, just let me pull that up real quick. No problem. Um, so Adelaide was uh, 46 inches and 38 pounds. So she's about what, three, is that 310-ish? Is that right? Uh, yep, okay. Oh, yeah, you're gonna have to do that conversion. <laughs> you said how many pounds? Uh, 38. 38, okay, gotcha. And then we got Everett. All right, let's see. Uh, he is uh, 37 inches. So three feet, one inch. <laughs> and 30 pounds. Right. And last but not least, we got Henry. Uh, he was 33 inches and 26 pounds. Okay. Okay, perfect. Got you both. Sound to back the losers. All right. Now, there is one thing that I always um, tell parents about, and you guys can choose to do what you want to with it, but um, the one policy that we talked about was the $10,000 um, on all the children. It is a term policy, so it, it does cover them for that up until the age of 21, and then they would have to either convert it or it would stop um, it, it completely in coverage. What most parents like to do is they like to actually set up the guaranteed coverage, which is um, you can get up to $25,000 and it locks in their age and their health. It never increases in price. It also doesn't expire. So uh, that is something you guys could choose to do if you want to. Um, and I can show you what that looks like, but it's one of the things a lot of parents do because then when they're older, they would still only pay the price right now at their current age, um, which is much cheaper than trying to qualify when you're older. Um, or if any health things popped up down the road, then they wouldn't have to worry about trying to qualify again. So do, would, do you guys want to see what that looks like or did you just want to sure. stick to 10? Okay, I'll show that to you here. So 12,298 and then our, we got your income covered still. All right, so for the kiddos, they're at pretty good ages. I'm just going to show you the 25,000 because that's what most people do. Um, kind of get a better rate for it as well. So for the oldest, it would be for 25,000, it would be $10.25. For 
the middle one, $9.98. And then for Henry, the little one would be $9. So again, it's always guaranteed to stay locked in, never changes. And then they can keep that, take over it when they're older and still only have to pay that. Mm -hmm. um, which as you guys can see, you know, for your policies at your age, it's actually, um, you know, you get a lot more coverage for a cheaper cost the younger that you do it. So mm -hmm. would you guys want to start them off with the guaranteed ones or do you want to just keep the term on there? Uh, we'll do the guaranteed ones. Guaranteed, okay. That's what most people will do. So we'll go ahead and keep that on there. And they're all pretty healthy, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Any medical problems or any medications that they take? Nope. You guys are both really healthy as well. So... Mm -hmm. We have what's called a terminal illness rider that you guys can all put on your policies. And what that means is if you were to get diagnosed down the road with a terminal illness and the doctor basically said, hey, you have 12 months or less to live, then they would allow you to take out half of your face amount on your policy and use it as a living benefit. And then the other half would get paid out at the time of death. So it doesn't cost you anything. It's just if you're healthy, we'll put it on there. And then for the kiddos, there is what they call guaranteed insurability. So it is $1.67 for each one to have it on there. Um, but what it does is it allows them uh, at six different ages in the future, they can add another 25,000 each time without having to prove their insurability. So no medical questions asked, they can get up to 150,000 um, in coverage. So would you guys wanna put that on their policies? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do that for them. Um, and then I'm just going to run through, we already answered all of these health questions. So you guys said no for everything, but you have seen a doctor in the last five years. So that's good. Um, I am just going to need the names of your doctors. I can always Google the address unless you have it um, and the phone number. So are, do you go to the VA or? Uh, no, we both go to the same doctor. So uh... great. Doctor, Doctor Deborah Miller. Okay, and what's a good address? Uh, Four eighty Pierce Street, P I E R C E. Okay, um, it's got a suite number two hundred five. Okay, and what's the name? Kingston, Pennsylvania, one eight seven zero four. Perfect, and then what is a good phone number? Five seven zero two eight seven. One four zero zero. You said you both go there. Yes. You guys are making it easy on me. <laughs> and then, Art, when's the last time that you were seen for anything? I was there in February this year. Okay. And then, Miss Brianna, how about for you? Uh, I was actually there last month. All right. So this is the twenty-three. Oh. And you guys are. What city are you currently in right now? Plains. P L A I N S. Got it. Okay. Best time to give you guys a call? Usually. Um, in the evenings. Evenings, okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go back over here. Um, now, guys, obviously, when someone passes, we have to be able to identify that person in order to pay out a claim. So, just as you guys have filled out any other insurance paperwork, they would need to go ahead and list your social on there. So, Art, what's a good social for you? Uh, one six five six zero seven two one one. Okay, and then Brianna, how about for you? Uh, one eight six three four two nine eight nine. Got it. All right, and then Art, we said you are a VP of Sales. What's the name of your company? Uh, Andus. A N D U S. And then we've got, okay. And then we've got um, Ms. Brianna as a homemaker, All right? And what was the good address for you guys to mail the policies to? Fifty-four Hudson Road, Hudson like the river. Okay. And it's Plains, one eight seven zero five. And the best email to send over the documents to sign. Uh, that a dot Francis at Gmail would be a good one. All right. And who answers their phone the most between the two of you guys? Honestly, probably you. Yeah, you can do mine. Uh, it's five seven zero 
905-7888. And then we'll put Brianna's second. What is that? Area code 607. Oh, all right, gotcha. 765-1652. All right, perfect. And I do need your guys' driver's license number. So Art, I'll start with yours. Okay, uh, it's 25-263-111. Pennsylvania. Okay, and then Brianna. Uh, two five two six three one two three. One two three. All right, got it. Now I would assume that when something happens to either one of you guys, you're going to want the other as the primary beneficiary. Is that right? Yes. Or so when something happens to you, we would put Brianna on there as the primary. And if something happened to both of you guys, um, did you want to put your sister for everything then? Yes. Mm -hmm. Her last name was Smith, right? Yeah. All right, and then we've got, if something happens to Brianna, we're going to put R as the primary. And then Michaela. And now, do you guys have a preference for the kiddos? If something were to happen to um, the kids, who the primary would be, I would say in most scenarios, we put the wife because women have a longer life expectancy and a lot yes. of time handle everything. But do you guys have a preference? That's fine. We can do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Got, got it. So we'll put Brianna first and then Art will put you second. I didn't think you would mind. <laughs> All right. And then... Right. We are not replacing any policies. You guys are both U.S. citizens, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and put the automatic uh, premium loan provision on the policy. That also doesn't cost you anything, but all it does, guys, is if for some reason you were to lapse on the insurance or miss a payment, they would actually take from your cash value to pay the premiums to make sure that you actually didn't lose the coverage. Um, so then, you know, sometimes if people get sick or they go into the hospital and they miss a payment, um, or the money wasn't in their account, then we would still be able to make sure they're covered so they don't lose their insurability. And then um, last thing on here, oh, let me make sure we get this on there. I did forget to put the kudos. We did that. Okay, there we go. And um, did you guys want to use Chase Bank for the bank account? Yeah, that's fine. And where did you guys set that up at? Uh, uh, Pittston. The TTST one. Got it. All right. And then uh, what is the routing number? Uh, zero, two, three, one, three, one, two, zero, two, six. Any numbers there? Hold on. Uh, hang on. Zero three one three one two two one six. Sorry about that. There we go. Nope, that's okay. So I'm just gonna read it back to you to make sure I didn't type it wrong. So zero three one three one two two one six. Yes. Okay. And then what would be a good account number for you? Zero zero eleven three four three. One three one. All right. Let me just make sure that I repeat that back to you as well. Zero zero one one three four three one three one. Yes. Okay. And that's a checking account. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And um, as far as the draft date for you guys, we can choose any time between the twentieth through the twenty eighth, or the first, second, or third. What would be the best time every month for this to come out? Uh, we could just take it to the first. First, okay, easy yep. enough. All right, so guys, your first draft would come out in the next five business days. We usually tell people 24 to 48 hours to be safe, uh, but typically within five days. Now, your first one would come out now, and then you won't have another one until September 1st, because we're pretty okay. close to the first of August. Um, and your first payment would be 21562. There is a $5 application fee on that um, just for one time. You'll only see it on the first one. So your normal monthly payments would be 210.62. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And you guys are okay with the 210 every month? You feel like that would be comfortable? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And just to verify, you guys are not on Medicaid, right? Either of you guys? Correct. All right. I think we got everything here, guys. Let me just double check real fast and then I will get these signatures over to you quickly. We will wrap up here. Oh, let me just fix that real quick. Okay, we should be good to go now. We are working on updating our application software, so forgive me. <laughs> All right, guys, so um, these will all be sent over to you, but these are the um, terminal illness writer explanation that I went over with you guys as far as if you guys did get diagnosed with a terminal illness, all of you guys, you two and the children are covered for those. And then you'll also have an outline of coverage uh, for your accident policy. And there's an electronic application disclosure, essentially that just says that we are signing everything electronically. Um, it is done through our software, which is uh, encrypted software. It's actually safer than probably doing online banking. Um, so everything is done through that instead of online. And then a HIPAA form, of course, I'm sure you guys are familiar with HIPAA, uh, but they will not release your medical information to anybody. They only check it once for the purpose of um, approving your application. And then um, the HIV consent, sometimes if people are needing a medical them. Um, they could possibly want to test for uh, HIV and we don't have to do the oral specimen anymore because we're virtual, but sometimes um, if you do need a medical exam, then they would do a, one of those little fun swabs if you're lucky enough to get one. Um, if you're a non-tobacco user, they may ask that just to prove that you aren't so you can keep that lower rate for your insurance. All right, so Real fast here, um, let me get the signatures. And then there's a couple of things I just wanna um, explain to you guys real fast. There's three things that can happen during the underwriting process. Uh, one, everything just stays the same as we just went over today, which means you would have the same um, price for the insurance and same amount of coverage. So that's what I would assume would have happened with you guys, just how we, you know, based on how we answered those medical questions. Sometimes if somebody does answer some questions um, on the application with a yes, then you know they would still be able to get approved for the coverage, but they may have to pay a little bit more for it. They call it a health adjustment, uh, just based off that person's medical background or criminal background, because uh, this is all based off of age, health, and habits. So if there was um, you know, some type of an adjustment, then we would call you at the time that it comes back from underwriting and we would go over it with you guys and let you know what your options are on that. Um, and then there are times where underwriters could decline a policy. Um, now, again, based on how you answer the questions, I would not assume that would happen, but I'm not an underwriter, so I can't tell you that 100%. Um, but if that were to be the case, they would refund you any premiums that you have paid in at that point for the policy. So again, not telling you any of those things would happen. I just have to tell you that they can uh, for every single person. Do you guys have any questions about that? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, and so let me just get my signatures on here real fast for you, and then I'll send this over your way. Are you guys familiar with DocuSign? Yes. Okay, great. Shouldn't take long at all then. You guys have been pretty easy. You don't have any questions for me? <laughs> yeah, you're pretty thorough, so. You must be getting tired on me. Maybe that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's about that time of the evening. I appreciate you guys' patience. Oh, of course. I'll process it all tonight and wake up in the middle of the night and have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that. If that happens, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. All right, so we got all that there, guys. Um, so last thing, I just, we got to make sure we fill out that report card. Um, so let me go back to that quickly. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. 
Let me know when you guys can see that again. Yep, you guys can see it. Okay, so they just have a couple questions real quick uh, so we can turn this back in. And they want to know if you belong to a VSO, which I believe you said no, right, Art? Correct, yep. Right. Uh, they want to know you guys get to rate me on a scale of one to five, one being the worst, five being the best. Was I courteous to you guys? Yes, no. five stars. Okay. Thanks, guys. I've never got a one. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> was I respectful of your time? Yes. Right. And then do you guys think this is a valuable program for our veterans? Yeah, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Any extra comments you would want to leave as feedback to the veterans organization? No, it was just very thorough. Yeah. This is great. Pretty impressed with the offering. All right. Perfect. And then there's just a couple other ones over here. Um, they want to know what you guys like best about the program. We were able to give you guys a free accidental death benefit as well as your last will and testament at no cost. And we went over your burial benefits. Did you guys have a favorite or did you like all three of them? Um, the, yeah, we liked all three. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we did set up your freedom of choice. Uh, you also have the act in the hospital benefits and the income protection. So I was assuming you guys liked those, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, Art, would you like any more information on becoming a VSO member? Yeah, absolutely. Great. And then um, last thing would be, we are currently looking to hire other veterans or maybe some people that are uh, looking for a career opportunity that might want to work from home helping other veterans. Do you guys happen to know anybody that might be interested in a career opportunity? I mean, we'll keep our... We'll keep our ears open, but is just doing the same thing that that you did today, or? Yeah, that's it. If you okay. know anyone that could do what yeah. I just did and likes to help yeah. people, they might be a good fit with, with us. Okay. Yeah, we'll let you know. Okay, awesome. So, um, last thing, I just have a quick quiz for you. Do you guys know what we did today? Yes. So, <laughs> uh, looks like we set up some life insurance stuff and uh, there's some hospital benefits in case one of our kids dive bombs out of the crib and breaks his arm. <laughs> Which they uh, could be using very soon. <laughs> and uh, then we got the will, we're getting the will set up and everything too, so. Okay, all right, good. You guys are paying attention on me. Uh, so I just wanna make sure I don't get a call tomorrow and you're like, Ashley, what did I just set up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> gotta make sure you're paying attention attention. Uh, but one thing I will tell you guys, like for this stuff, it's not a short term fix, it is a long term solution. And what I mean by that is that we can never connect the dots looking into the future. But we uh, can connect the dots looking backwards. So we have no way of knowing what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. But if you look back, one thing I can guarantee is that if you fast forward 10, 15 years on the road, um, you're never going to regret the fact that you guys decided to do a good thing and be prepared for your family because this is money that will always be there for them. And the reason why you guys can feel good about that is because it can give you a peace of mind. Um, but most importantly, like I said, it will always be there for your family, especially when they need it the most because they will use this at one point in time, okay? So I just wanna make sure before we jump off of here that the price is comfortable. Uh, we have everything coming out on the first of every month, um, but you guys definitely feel okay with the 210 every month. If not, let's change it now. No, we're happy with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, guys. Well, I'm so happy I can help you. If you need anything at all, you'll have my information. I'll be shooting you guys an email with copies of everything, a service folder that has all of the stuff that we talked about. Uh, but don't hesitate to reach out if you guys need anything. Okay. Perfect. Thank That's you. Good. Thank you for everything. Have a good night. Thanks, Sarah. Good night. Okay, so we got to watch Ashley Russ do her thing. Now, interestingly enough, she has a little bit of a different approach, right? She talks about the, in the beginning, not in the beginning, but as she's starting to fill out EAP, she asks for the social security numbers, right? And the driver's license. And she even goes to the banking information. Now, I don't advise that we do that, but she's been doing it for seven years. She was number one in 2019. So, that is an art that works for her. She can easily overcome somebody pushing back when you're brand new and you're trying to do that. I'd much rather have you give to receive, right? So go through the entire process and give them access to see everything that you're doing and then ask at the end for the final bits of information. 
And the reason I have you do it is because 10, it took her what, 12 minutes? 12 minutes out of your life is not that big a deal. Even if they turn out and they go, no, I don't want to do it. 12 minutes won't kill you. And the likelihood you're going to get people to give you the information definitely goes up. What's the other thing that she didn't do or we didn't see her do, but she probably did that we learned about yesterday? Joshua Eba, what would that be? Uh, uh, bank verification. Exactly. So she doesn't do bank verification where the client can see it. And I'm going to tell you nine times for Sunday, don't let the client see that you're doing a bank verification. And the reason for that is because every single time you put something in front of them, it's a potential objection. There's no need to do it. You don't need the permission to run that. They've already given you the banking information. So quite frankly, the way that I would advise that you do it, and the way that I do it is I actually put the banking information into the bank verification tool first. Once it's in there, then I put it into EAP. Yes, and I'll show you exactly how I do it. Yeah, Ben, go ahead. Uh, certain documents, especially with like, you know, for my background, Medicare, you can't copy and paste. Can you copy and paste that from oh. the verification? You have to do it each time individually? Well, you can put it in the bank verification tool and then copy it into EAP. And when you go to do it the second time, it won't let you paste. Gotcha. You know what I mean? You've got you to finger it in again. <clears throat> and that's a good security measure to ensure that uh, theoretically you're not copying and pasting things somewhere where you shouldn't be, right? All right, All right so what I'm going to do is go ahead and log in to your eApp. So I'm going to log in as a trainee. So it's going to be eApp training, and the password is the word training. It's going to generate an index of sales, and then theoretically it's going to see, <clears throat> who did we do yesterday? Richard Reyes, right? We're going to see Richard Reyes. So let's see. I'm going to share my screen and let's see if we can actually see Richard Reyes. Pop up there. Go to existing applications. Richard Reyes is right there. Click next. There he is in all his glory. Click next again. And now we're at this point. Okay. So we're going to finish this one off. <clears throat> and we know that we did the first page. Whoops, not that one. Sorry. The super combo. We did the first page. With the exception of the social security number, the driver's license, and the banking information. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the second page, because the second page is where all of our underwriting is. If you'll remember, Ashley did not go to the second page, did she? Do you guys remember seeing her do that? Yeah, she just clicked nose on all of them. Yeah, because she actually had asked the questions earlier. So if you watch the HP Pro, you can go in and click on uh, medical questions. That's icon down at the bottom. And you can actually ask those questions ahead of time. And if there's no issues, they're all no's, you're fine. The reason we put it in there is not so that you ask them then. It's a way for you. If someone says, well, I'm not really sure I want to buy, you can say, well, I'm not sure if you qualify. Let's make sure you qualify first. So because she had the answers to everything already, she just basically went to this page and put in a bunch of no's. What I'm going to do is show you if any of them are yeses, what we have to do. Uh, did somebody have their hand up? It went away really fast. Who was that? That was me. So I did get my stuff downloaded and I filled in everything. I couldn't remember what the first name was because you didn't have your screen up anymore, but I do have Reyes, but I filled in everything as far as what I could remember, but I think I'm missing something. Would I be able to share my screen just so I can catch up to that second thing? Yeah, go ahead, share your screen. Okay. Uh, actually, let me give you the ability to share your screen. Okay, okay, okay. now you can share your screen. Okay, let me click. Oh, sorry, trying to get my screen big enough so you can see it. Okay. Yeah, so you called him Justin. That's fine. Who yeah, cares? I don't remember what the first name was. All right, I'm scroll not down. Quite sure, what I'm missing. Um, scroll down. Make so it you bigger. Here. Click, yeah, just just grab the bar and pull it down. Yeah, I'm trying. My mouse is kind of wonky. Oh my goodness! I'm gonna have more gray hair. There, there you go. go. Okay. Sorry. All right. So what you need to do is click on B in that grayed out uh, column. Move your cursor to the left about two inches. 
click on D, 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 D. D yes, boy, no, you're, you're okay. up right there. There you okay. go. Now, now you just have to wait a moment and let the system catch up. And once okay. it catches up, those boxes should turn blue. Here okay. we go. Okay. And now you can pick, okay. I don't know, 30,000. Mm -hmm. And give them a TIR. You don't have a TIR listed for both. You need to do that as the terminal illness writer. And then it's a, uh, just give 50,000 for, yeah, for the, uh, because it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Button scroll down. Now that you have B, you have to give the A71 policy to both of them. So it's family. So click on B. Yep. Now it's family. family. There you go. Okay. And then I should have everything. I just need to give a beneficiary, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I and mean, that's fine. You're just filling in the blanks. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You're very welcome. Okay, so now we're going to go back and look at my screen and we're going to continue to run through this. So now we're on the second page. So we're going to go through this. So here's the way it works on this page. You have to read the questions the way that they're written as close as possible because the insurance commissioners for every state and the uh, legal authorities in the various provinces and regions in Canada and New Zealand have agreed on what the language is that is being uh, being used to ask the question and our attorneys have agreed on it. So what we don't want you to do is just put in any words yourself. But remember, when we do the letter in HP Pro, we read the paragraph that's in the script verbatim and then we say, now what all that means is, and then we give an explanation. So what we need to do is make sure that we read this correctly. So if I'm going, let's see, it's Richard, what did I call his wife, Julie? So what I'm gonna say, hey, Richard or Julie, have either of you, and then I read it exactly, ever been treated or advised to be treated for alcoholism, alcohol abuse, including membership in AA, or been advised by a physician to reduce alcohol consumption? So I can ask them both at the same time because they're both there. Now, if they have a question about the question, I can then explain what the what we're looking for. But I've got to read it the right way so that I can say with confidence every time I read these questions the same way to every single client. So in this case, they're going to say, nope, I don't have any problem. Oh, but wait, no, they do. It turns out Richard has been a member of AA. So what you would then do is you would say, yes, Richard and Julie come up. You select the one that's appropriate. So, yes, we're going to say Richard. And when we say close, now look what happens you start to get these additional forms that will come up pursuant to the yes answers over here. So in terms of alcohol, you get an alcohol exclusion that say, hey, basically you can't get paid out if you die when you are under the influence because you're known to be a drinker. Ooh, okay. Then you have a writer that says, hey, the max we're gonna pay out is the premiums paid or the cash surrender value. And then we're gonna ask you questions about your alcohol use. Every one of these blue boxes has to be filled out by you asking the questions of the client and they're seeing this on the screen. So the whole point of this is to show you that you don't have to remember what questionnaire to bring up at what time. You just have to answer these questions over here appropriately and then the questionnaire will pop up on the screen over here and you just need to open it up. Any questions about the alcohol one? They all work very similarly similar to each other. All right, so in this case, I'm going to pull that off. I'm going to say no, and now you see it went away. Have you ever used drugs not prescribed by physicians such as cocaine, amphetamines, barbiturates, hallucinogens, tranquilizers, narcotics, or sedatives? So again, if you were to say yes, and let's say druggies for Richard, right, what ends up happening is you get the drug questionnaire. And now you have to explain, did you ever use street drugs or abuse prescription medications? Answer the question, and then you have to tell us what you use, when it started, and when it finished. If they're still using it, it's an auto decline. If it was 20 years ago and they were in college and got a little experimental and they're now 45, then yeah, you would just put in the date it began and the date it ended. Now notice that this is the same drug question there. You'll see it pop up when somebody answers the question of do you use marijuana? Exactly the same. Why does that form come up exactly the same? Simply because people who use marijuana, there is a tendency among them to continue to chase the high and they progress to stronger drugs. Not always the case. Actually, it is always the case. You know how I know it's absolutely always the case? 
because marijuana, when I was a kid in the 70s, the THC value was this. Now, if you buy it legally from a dispensary, it's ridiculously <laughs> high. So this just shows you that people are continually continuing to chase the high. All right. And then obviously, if you're using marijuana, guess what? You're considered a tobacco user for the purposes of rates. Uh, Millie, what can I do for you? Just to confirm, like only if they're still using hard drugs, but not marijuana is an auto decline. Is that right? If you, well, that's true. We'll come to the marijuana question a little bit later. I'll delineate it a little closer. But yes, if you're using hard drugs, it's an auto decline. Okay. Okay. So in this case, we're going to say no. Then it says, have you ever had a driver's license uh, suspended or revoked because of a moving violation or convicted, including driving while in intoxicated or on the influence. If we say yes, and we say uh, DUI, I was arrested other than DUI, then what happens is you get the arrest questionnaire and then the driver's license questionnaire. See that, the arrest questionnaire. Okay, what did you do? What happened? Blah, blah, blah. Every little bit of information. And they have to provide it. If any time an additional form comes up and they don't want to provide the information, it's an auto decline, right? We have to know the information. We have to assess the risk. The driver's license question will come up here. Hey, have you ever had it suspended? What violations did you have? Et cetera, et cetera. In this case, though, we're not going to do that. We'll remove that and we're just going to say no. And you see it all went away. <clears throat> now, the next one. Have you flown within the last two years or intend to fly in the future as other than a passenger on a scheduled airline? The heck does that mean? Well, what it means is basically, do you, are you a pilot? The issue, however, is that we are prohibited from discriminatory rules to ask if you are a pilot. So the lawyers have come up with this odd way. Well, that's not odd. It's a good way, but it's an awkward way. How about that? It's an awkward way of asking the question. So if I'm asking Melissa, I'll be right with your question, Melissa. If I say, hey, Melissa, <clears throat> excuse me, have you, ever, are, have you flown within the last two years as, or intend to fly in the future as other than a passenger on a scheduled airline? A lot of times what Melissa will say is, well, yeah, I, I fly, I've flown, right? And because they're not understanding what the question is. So sometimes we need to explain it. Providing an explanation is okay. Hey, what we're trying to determine is whether or not you're a pilot. Because if you are, I have to fill out this additional form. Oh, no, I'm not a pilot. I think twice in my career I've had somebody go, oh, yeah, I'm a pilot. No problem. I have a pilot to form to uh, have you fill out. But I can't ask them as the first thing, are you a pilot? Melissa, what is your question? Just <clears throat> for the previous number 20, um, like when you go into some of those questions, I like get asked like, what is your fine? There were some detailed questions. Like, what if they don't know that stuff? You're saying for the driving question? Yeah, like some of that, like when I just like quickly glanced at that. Like what yes, if they don't know, really like maybe it was eight, nine, 10 years ago or whatever that may be. Like, what if they don't know some of those answers? Like how long were you in jail? Maybe they don't remember how many years or whatever. Well, yeah, what what they, if, okay. What you're looking for is the best that they can do to answer. Cause really here's what happens. Okay. We're not going to make a decision based on their answers. The decision we'll make in underwriting is going to compare what they said that they knew or whether they disclosed it all, as opposed to what their record is. Okay. If you're doing this, then morale, you morale, morale. Right? <laughs> okay. Right. So that's all it is. It's just conf and giving us an idea of, hey, you remember this, but it was 30 years ago, etc. Okay, gotcha. So at least you disclosed it. It's when people don't disclose they were arrested last week. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That's okay. the major Thank issue. You. Okay. So I'm just going to say no for this, and I'm going to say no for I don't do an airline. Next one is, have you participated in the last two years or intend to participate in the future in any, any of the following activities? Same concept, because if you do, then your risk profile is higher. We have to ask you additional questions, okay? Now, 23, have you ever been advised to take tests not done so or not received the results been diagnosed as having or received treatment for high blood pressure, chest pain, heart attack, stroke, or any heart, blood, or circulatory disorder other than HIV? More often than not, the age group that you're talking to, what is the one thing that they typically have? Quickly, anybody know? Heart anybody? disorder. High blood pressure. Blood, blood pressure. pressure. Heart disorder, yeah, we hope they don't have too many, but usually it's higher blood pressure, right? Because our capillaries are shrinking and our vessels get smaller. We're still pumping blood, which means our blood pressure is going to go up. So <clears throat> let's just say yes right there. 
and we'll say Richard Reyes high blood pressure because that's typically the one you see. Now, if you have anything else, you got to put it in there. But high blood pressure is the one you're going to see more often than not. And when you do it, you get this high blood pressure questionnaire. So you're going to open it up. It's going to say date diagnosed. Do you take medication? If you do, give us the names and who's the doctor. Now, right here where it says reading, I do not want you to put what they tell you, 120 over 80, 125 over 90. It doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to underwriting what the number is. What matters is if it's under control and whether the reading is normal. So normal for me may be different than normal for Joshua, I would expect, right? So then you're just going to ask, hey, is your blood pressure normal now? Or is it under control? If the answer is yes, you're going to type in the word normal right here. And if it's under control because they're taking medication of some kind, you're going to say yes. Does that make sense to everybody? So I don't want to see numbers in here. I just want to see if it's normal and if it's under control. Okay. So we'll take that away. That's typically the one that you're going to see. So I'll say no. Now, the next one, have you ever been treated for any of the following conditions? Diabetes? Or other endocrine disorder? No. But if you said yes, say it's diabetes, you're going to close it. The diabetic questionnaire comes up because these people are older and typically they'll have it. If they're taking insulin and they're under the age of 60, that is an auto decline. And the reason for that is because insulin is a pretty serious drug and you've got a serious sugar imbalance. More people die from that uh, outside of our risk profile. Okay, so we have to fill out the information. So just know if you're under 60 and you're taking insulin, we can't cover you. All right, next one. Talked about that. Now we're going to say paralysis, epilepsy, mental disease, or disorder, or any nervous system or brain disorder. And what do you think the odds are people are going to admit they have a mental disorder or a brain disease? Yeah. Pretty, pretty low, right? Pretty low. So what we're going to say is no, but I want us all to remember 24B because we're going to come back to it. It's very important. It's very important, 24B. No, 25. Is the proposal short of arthritis or injury to or trouble with your back, knees, or any of your joints? We're not talking about an injury like a little bit and I, you know, twisted my knee. We're talking about significant injury that's going to last or some type of degenerative issue with your back, knees, or joints. Does that make sense? So I used to jump out of helicopters, right? Rappel down, probably slam my feet into the ground. So I've got joint problems, feet problems, back problems. That would be something you'd want to disclose. But if I just fell off my bike and I wrenched my back pretty bad five years ago, I don't need to know about that. So it's just, you know, does that make sense? You just want to have, you want to try to see if there's something that's going to be ongoing affect your health. Two, the best of your belief, do you have any physical impairment or departure from good health? The best of your knowledge and belief. What this means specifically is it's a considered a catch-all. Oh, wow. It's considered a catch-all. So when somebody's under the age of 60, we can't ask every single medical question that could possibly pertain. So we have this catch-all and we're putting it on the applicant saying, hey, to the best of your knowledge and belief, is there anything else that we should know about? Because if there is, you need to tell us. So that's what that question is for. And we're going to find out why that is important relative to people under 16 in just a minute. So they're going to say typically, nope, uh, I told you everything, I'm good to go. Okay. Have you ever been advised to take tests, not done so, or not received results, been diagnosed as having or received treatment for cancer, tumor, unexplained masses? That kind of makes sense. Because if you put yes, it's going to ask which one. And if you say that, you're going to get the cancer and tumor questionnaire, and then you got to fill all that out. And remember, the client is seeing all of this, so they're answering the questions that they see on the screen as you go through them. Okay? It's pretty straightforward to fill it out. In this case, we're going to say no. Now we're going to go to the top. Number 28, has any, uh, have either of you in the last five years had a physical examination? 100% of the time, you are going to put yes. Sorry, up here. Yes. 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 Because here's the interesting thing. A physical examination in terms of insurance is not like a physical. A physical examination is whenever you've encountered a medical professional for any particular reason at all. So I had my COVID shot, which I highly regret, but I had it. That's considered a physical examination. 
If you're a male and you go online and you get the ED medication that you can now get, that is considered a physical examination. And the reason for that is because the medical professionals are the ones that are on the hook to ensure that you're medically okay for any treatment. The insurance companies looks at that and says, okay, you have a lower risk because some, somebody's seen you. So that typically means any time in the last five years, the answer is always yes. If the answer is no, they're going to trial your application. So that means that this person has never been seen by anybody medically. We got to make sure they're okay. So 100% of the time you would say yes. Now the question on 28B is, have you had any medical treatment, including prescription medications? Okay, now this is any medical treatment whatsoever. It doesn't matter. If you had a kid in the last four years as a female, that's considered medical treatment. If I have high blood pressure and I got medicine, that's a medical treatment. If I went to the emergency room because I was in an accident, that's considered medical treatment. Any type of medical treatment, including prescription medications, needs to be disclosed. And if you were in the hospital due to it, you need to disclose that as well. Ben, what's your question? Uh, yeah, the, just going over 28. Uh, so you want us just to put yes, but it is still necessary for us to ask the question, right? Well, what we're here, I take the assumptive close and I say, hey, uh, Ben, in the last five years, I'm sure you've had some type of medical or some type of interaction with medical facility, clinic, something, right? And more often than not, people say, yeah, I have. And you just click yes. Okay. That's what I mean by 100%. But if they come back and say, well, no, I haven't seen anybody in 10 years. All right, now I know it's going to be a trial, right? Okay. All right, so let's use you, Ben, as an example. No, let's not use Ben. Let's use, because this is, let's use uh, Millie, because this is what happens all the time. So Millie, have you had any medical treatment in the last five years? I have. What's that? I have. You have, okay. So then we would say yes. And then we would say, we'll say you for Julie. Okay, so it'll come up. And then I'm going to close it. And now I'm going to fill it out. Every one of these rows is for a unique either medical condition or treatment or a different occurrence that you're with medical professionals. So as an example, Millie, do you have children? You do, right? Under the age of five? I do, an eight-year-old. An eight-year-old. Okay, so that wouldn't count. Because what I would do is if it was under the age of five, then that would be a birth. I would put in your pregnancy and birth. Okay. okay. Any other medical thing that you've had, I would then list here. Okay. Yeah, I would get my eyes checked. And I would also, well, not your eyes checked. No, no, what we're talking about is anything else. I mean, having your eyes checked doesn't count, but it counts for medical. Uh, so having your eyes checked would count up here for physical examination, but medical treatment means there was some ailment that you had or you thought you had and you went and saw a medical professional. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if I'm sick okay. and I go see my primary care, that would count. Well, if they if they treat you with medicine, then yes, that would count. But okay. it definitely would count up here for the physical exam. So there's a difference, right? If you're sick, something's wrong with you, that's medical treatment, okay? Okay, so yeah, you got background noise. I got you. Uh, so, Melissa, let's go to you. You ready, Melissa? So, I'm going to ask you, have you had any medical treatment? And Melissa says yes. All right, Melissa. And then we come here and I'll say, okay, so what is it? Oh, I received uh, uh, my doctor for anxiety gave me 15 milligrams of Xanax to take twice a day or as needed, whatever you want to say. Okay. And so I'm going to put the date and I'm going to ask her where were you in the hospital due to it? She's going to say no. And I'm going to ask how long means if you were in the hospital, how many nights you were in there so that I can leave that blank. And then I would ask her for the physician uh, name and address and phone number. Okay. So now Melissa, you just told me that you're taking Xanax or Zoloft or lithium or something like that for uh, anxiety, depression, doesn't matter. You told me that, okay? And Melissa's like, God, don't choose me for this one. <laughs> of but course I, you choose me for the Xanax. <laughs> so now you have, uh, you're taking Xanax, okay? So now I, as the agent, I need to go back here, take my cursor and go back to 24B. Now, why the heck do I need to do that? Because 24B says, 
Have you been treated for paralysis, epilepsy, mental disease or disorder, or any other nervous system or brain disorder? Anxiety. And you're thinking, well, I have anxiety. I don't have, because you answered, no, you don't have a mental disease or disorder or paralysis or epilepsy, right? In your mind, I'm just a little anxious. Maybe, you know, I had something going on in my life and I just need to calm down a little bit or whatever. I might even be, have depression. Maybe I'm taking it for depression, not anxiety. So here's the key, though. Most people won't recognize that what they're doing is 24B. What we need to do, we're going to close this one. We're going to go to 24B. We're going to change it to yes. And I want you to select depression. And you're like, well, no, I'm not taking the Xanax for depression. I'm taking it for anxiety. But here's the key. When I click close, the depression questionnaire comes up. When I open it, the first thing it asks me, have you ever been treated for any type of depression, anxiety, or nervous disorder. This form has to be filled out. And more often than not, people will not tell you that they have depression, anxiety, or nervous disorder because the question says, do you have a mental disease or disorder? I don't know if you know this, but depression, anxiety is considered what? Mental disorder. It's considered well, it's a depression. It may not necessarily be a mental disorder as totally defined, but from mental. an insurance perspective, because you're taking that drug, it's affecting your mental acuity. It falls under this questionnaire. Does that make sense to everybody? So what we have found as an insurance company, particularly in the last 10 years, the amount of people who are taking any type of drugs for depression, anxiety, or nervous disorder was like this. Well, actually, back in the 50s, it was way down here. Then it went up just a little bit, just a little bit. As soon as we started shutting down asylums, it went like this. And we have a huge hockey stick now where we have a lot of people who take medication for depression, anxiety, or nervous disorders. And so what the insurance company has done is lump that under the depression questionnaire. So if you do not fill this out and somebody's taking a medical uh, or medicine to combat one of those issues, then uh, you, we will notify you and you're gonna have to redo it. Yes, Melissa. Is it fair to to word that like when you're saying that par paralysis epilepsy disease or disorder or any nerve oh, i'm no sorry wrong question so when i say that is it okay to say or any um men are you taking any medications for your mental health no do not do not say that because you need to read the question exactly as it is okay. and get the answer and the way that we find out is right here okay are you taking any prescription medications? If you are and you're under the age of 60, I need you to list them and tell me why you're taking them. Okay. So that's where she would say uh, medical, okay. right? She says right here, well, I'm taking it for anxiety. Immediately, that's the trigger that I need to get okay. this form filled out, which means I need to change 24B to a yes. So that's when we would just go back to those, to any of the questionnaires. Yeah. Okay. So I don't even tell the client. I just say, oh, no problem. I have to fill this one out here. So I change it and then I bring this one up and they may see the word depression. And I'll just say, well, it's not that it's depression. It's a questionnaire that covers anxiety as well. Okay. And they go, oh, okay. And then you just have to fill it out. Did you miss any okay. time for work? Are you currently disabled? Just the basics. Okay. Okay. But that form has to be filled out. All right. So let me get off of that one. Now we say, have you, uh, are you currently a resident in a nursing home or ever been diagnosed as having a terminal illness, including Alzheimer's? That is a, a non-starter. If you have an answer of yes to that, this is an auto decline. So if you remember, we've already ascertained the answer to that question because of the four questions that we asked when we we're at the plan generator, or I'm sorry, the needs analysis. If you guys remember, there's four questions. Any of the answer, well, one of the answers to the questions would give you Hey, do you have Alzheimer's? Are you in a nursing home? Nope, I'm at the house, right? Ben, what can I do for you? Would you recommend getting this out of the way before you start the presentation, just so you're not wasting your time? Uh, no, and I'll tell you, here's why. The presentation to me, and most of the leaders will tell you that your whole focus should be to offer the no-cost benefits and get the referrals. 
I'm going to add to that part. I'm sorry. Before the, okay. before so the after that part, if, okay, so here, if this becomes a part, part, okay, Ben? The art here is, if you're talking to a husband and wife, maybe the husband or wife won't qualify because of this reason, but that doesn't mean that the other party won't qualify. So what you do is you pitch everything, and as you're getting the responses back, it's telling you, how do I want to position everything that I'm doing such that I can help this family get some protection? And it may not be the best way that they want it because maybe the husband doesn't qualify due to whatever reason. But if I can fold him in under A71, then he can get some life insurance. It's just going to be predicated on him dying by an accident. Okay. The other thing I would tell you, it, it only takes 10 or 12 minutes to go through this. I think that if you're doing the right thing and helping the client through, very rarely will they give you information that's going to blow up the entire application. It does happen. Uh, but as you get more and more experience, you'll be able to pick that up sooner in the process. Like, for example, if you're sitting with somebody and they have the oxygen tank uh, thing around there. Yeah, that's a non-starter, right? That's a can't provide any coverage for that person. OK, did I answer your question, Ben? Yes. OK, so have you ever been hospitalized? I'm going to say no. Uh, and then are you currently resident? So that's going to be no. Now, 30 uh, A through H is just the conditions that they have, right? <clears throat> so you're going to ask each one is written. Asthma, emphysema, ulcer colitis, cirrhosis, kidney, disease of the breast, loss of hearing, loss of sight, rheumatoid arthritis, or AIDS. If you answer yes to any of these, let's say this one, it's just going to bring this up and then you have to fill out the questionnaire. Okay, it's very similar to what we've done before. So when all this is done, <clears throat> And hopefully you're all filling it out exactly the way that I'm doing it. When you get down here to 32, 32 is asking in the last year, have you ever had unplanned weight loss, limp limb enlargement, current fever, diarrhea, or pneumonia? Barbara Wombacker, why do you think that question is there? Barbara, it is day eight. You're killing me. We can't hear you. Barbara, can you hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, Barbara? Because we can't hear you. Okay. I can hear you. I'm sorry. My my mute thing was off for some reason. I don't know why. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So um, your question was if you had any, um, it was if you had any, um, cold conditions or, you know, flu or pneumonia or anything like that, right? No. Are you looking at a, are you looking at question 32 on your computer? Yeah, let me look. Move it over this way. It says within the last year, has any proposed insured had unplanned weight loss Limp node enlargement or recurring fever, diarrhea, or pneumonia. Okay, so all right. Percent to a flu. Why do you think we're asking that question? Because you want to know if they have, um, if there's any kind of um, internal problem that you know something that they don't know that's diagnosed, that's not diagnosed mm -hmm. yet. If they they're having you know uh, weight loss and diarrhea and stuff like that, it could be from you know, medications that they're taking, or it could be because they have some kind of gastrointestinal problem. It could be because they're, you know, so Barbara, Barbara, yeah. Barbara, the reason this came up is because of COVID. Okay. This is purely because of COVID because this question didn't exist three years ago. Okay. And then it all of a sudden popped up because we can't ask if you have COVID. Right, okay. we didn't know enough about COVID yet, but we can ask this question, which would then allow us to look at the medical records and see if, in fact, you had COVID, <clears throat> because the <clears throat> excuse me, the policy was <clears throat> when COVID first happened, it was at its height. You couldn't get insurance for a year. Then it was six months. Then it was three months. Okay, that's why that question is there. Then we ask, uh, do you use or smoke cigarettes in any form? If the answer is yes. Then what happens is we have to make sure we change the NTU status, right? Because NTU means non-tobacco user. Okay. So if I answer the question of tobacco use as a yes, now they're incongruent and you're going to get an error. OK, 
Okay. And then last but not least, hey, does any one of you use marijuana in the past year? Oh, it turns out the answer is yes, and they both do. So if that's the case, then I get the drug questionnaire for each one of them. And now I need, so this one up here is going to be a no. But then I ask, are you using marijuana in the past two years or daily, three to four times, one to two, less often than one time per week? If you use marijuana daily, you're an auto decline. Really? Why is, really? Yeah, because if you're, if you're using marijuana daily, then you're up here. Now, in my opinion, you could submit it as a trial because that won't hurt you. But here's what happens. The company is already going to take your risk profile and change it to a tobacco user, right? That's number one. Number two, if there's any history at all with you involved with the law or going to a clinic for either alcohol or drug abuse in any way, shape, or form, you're going to be declining. But if none of that occurred, like if you're just a, just a pothead, then you just get <laughs> issued substandard or something? Well, you could be rated, and that's why I want you to submit it as a uh, trial. Okay. Adam, you have a question? Yeah, so um, as far as comfortability for the clients we're working with, and so that we know our place here too, um, for example, I'm in Ohio, um, and I think that marijuana is legal and medical purposes, but it's not rec recreational yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so say I am working somewhere in Ohio and they recreationally smoke. So that would be considered illegal right now. Um, now, to ensure that they are being honest as well, um, do we, is there any mandatory reporting on our end that's required? Um, no. no. Okay, so. We make you know, no but, but legal. Like, right. Sorry, we, uh, we don't make any legal or moral judgment at all. Okay. It doesn't matter to us if it's illegal or illegal. I mean, hey, you could have used street drugs back in, you know, 10 years ago. That's illegal mm -hmm. in every state except maybe Oregon and maybe San Francisco, mm -hmm. right? But it's illegal, yep. but we don't report it to anybody. What we care about is the health of your body. That's all right. we care about, right? So, so, so when I ask be... somebody, do you use marijuana? I'm like, hey, I just need to know, do you smoke or use marijuana in any form? And if you do, how often do you use it? That's it. So this form in the future can't be incriminating or anything, correct? No, absolutely not. Absolutely. Melissa, what can I do for you? I know nothing about the laws I'm here in Arkansas because, again, I just got here as far as the marijuana laws. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that it is legal here for medical use. Um, and so as an example, if someone has their their medical marijuana card and they're using it for, say, anxiety, mm -hmm. they don't have a medical condition and they're, they're using mm -hmm. marijuana for anxiety and that's their only condition, um, is that going to be something that, that it would be an auto-reject? No. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's like, that's why I want to say think about that like if they're if they're using daily for with a medical with a prescription it doesn't okay so let's be clear if you're using okay. marijuana it doesn't matter what you're using it for okay we, so we don't ask that question what we ask is how often are you using it so if it's a daily then you're gonna it, it, it's gonna be an in my opinion you would submit it as a trial it okay. will probably be declined if they have anything else they haven't disclosed to you okay so you understand the process, right? If, okay, that's kind of where I was son, trying to think. It doesn't matter why, but I'm just thinking like if that you're using it for another medical doesn't reason. Matter. We don't even ask the question why are you using it, do we? We don't ask. All we ask is, are you using it? And then if you are, this form comes up and we say, how often do you use it? That's it. We don't make a moral judgment on anything or a legal judgment at all. What we care about is the health of your body. Brooke Pickett, what can I do for you? Well, so when you ask the prescriptions question, if they have a medical card and it's for marijuana, and is that, do, I don't know how that works. I've never talked to somebody that has that, but is that a prescription? Uh, I don't believe so because the mirror, at least what I'm used to, the medical marijuana prescriptions doesn't tell you how much you need to take for a particular condition. It just says, you're authorized to uh, purchase it. 
for the medical condition. So really, prescriptions are going to be for the standard prescriptions you would get from the doctor okay. for, a, for a physical or mental ailment. Okay. Again, no moral or legal judgment here. It's purely the actuary tables. That's all it is. So over the years, we know that if you smoke marijuana, you're more likely to die sooner, just like if you were a tobacco user. That's why you have the rates of a tobacco user. Okay. All right. So then that was done. We're now we've gone through all of that. The question here is going to be no. So I'm going to change that. So all that goes away. I'm going to add in uh, some mumbo jumbo here, but basically you're going to put in the phone number and the uh, name and address of the physicians. Okay. And then you're also going to put in the date last seen, and that needs to be within, according to this one, right? Five years. So I'm just going to put 11 of 2020. So 11 of 2020, I'm going to leave the medical records ID blank for a minute. And I'm going to come back here. The city is going to be San Jose because that's where it was on page one, right? That was the address right there, San Jose. So the city here is San Jose, the agent statement. I certify that I've asked all the questions and truly and accurately uh, recording the information supplied by the applicant to the best of mom's belief, the insurance applied for is not 100% of the time is not intended to replace any insurance currently in effect. All right, is not. And then down here, best time to call, I'm going to select one of these times, I'll ask them typically I just do all day eight to nine. And I mail the policy 100% of the time to the policy holder, not to the agency. In the old days, we used to mail it to the agency. We'd get the policies and then we'd go visit the client and deliver the policies. We don't do that anymore. We send it right to the policy holder. So now I have filled everything in to the best of my abilities. I think everything is done here. Everything is done here. Good to go. I then come back to page one and now I'm going to finish off the social security number, driver's license and the banking information. And the reason I'm going to do that now is because I have given a lot to the client. They have seen everything. We've spent 10 minutes going through their medical history. I've gotten to know them a little bit more, hopefully. And now me asking these questions is not going to alienate them. So what I want you to do is put your social security number up here, at least the format of your social security number and just change it. Okay. Just change it, but make sure the format is correct because if you put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it will reject it because the system knows that's not a valid social security number. Okay. Once you have social security numbers over here, now you need to put driver's license. The driver's license, oh, let me rephrase that. The system knows the format for every state and province. So if you put a driver's license in that doesn't match the state, it's going to kick it back and give you an error. And we'll see that. I'm going to put this and I'm going to say for California. And then I'm going to do this one, which I know is the right format. And do that for California and we'll see what happens. Okay. Now I have that done. I filled that out in and now I'm ready to do this, which is what? The banking information. So I need to bring up an actual bank verification tool. We all remember that, right? Yeah. And did we remember where that's located? Anybody? In the policy yeah. part of uh, Planet OT. Planet that's Office. right. So let me bring it over here. There's Planet logged in the Planet. If I scroll down over here, I see the word policy. If I click on policy. Uh, in this case, I only have a mod inbox and medical exam because I'm not in production, right? But the other way you can get to it is you can go home, you go down to uh, uh, virtual sales. You can come down here until you see bank account verification. You can click on that. And if you were able to in production and had an agent number where your producer it would come up right here. So I'm going to show you what that actually looks like by logging in as someone else. So we can see what that looks like. Oh no, did I do it wrong? Let's see. B.
Okay, here we go. So this is what it looks like when I come here, logged in as this individual here, I come down to policy, and now I see bank account verification, and there it is, right? The other way that I could do this is if I'm here, I can then again scroll down to virtual sales, click on it, opens up a new tab, scroll down until I see her, that's Jillian Getz, I can click on bank account verification, and then it shows up. So this is what I do. I have this, the client's not seeing this, and I'm going to say, okay, I need uh, your routing number. Is that what I do? No, that's not what I do. This is what I do. I will open up a new Google, and it will sit there, and I'll say, okay, well, who do you bank with? Because I need to get your banking information. And they'll say, uh, I work with Bank of America. So in my mind, what, or I'm sorry, on the screen, what I'm going to do is type in Bank of America. And I'm going to say, is your account located in South Lake, California? Is that where it's open? And they'll say, hopefully they'll say yes. So then I'll say San Jose, California routing number. And you can see I'm doing this real time quickly as they're telling me that. And then I'm going to say, I have your routing number as 121-000358. Is that correct? And they'll say, yeah, that's right. So then I will come back to EAP. And down here, I will now type in Bank of America, San Jose, because that's where they said they created the account, California. And I now know it's 121-000-358. Hit tab, 121-000-358. So what I'm doing is uh, the values do not match. Oh, I forgot a zero. 0358. So you can see if you don't put in the number correctly the second time, then what happens is it gives you an error. Now I'm doing this because I'm not asking for anything yet, right? I am giving that, hey, you told me your bank account, I'm going to give you the routing number because it's publicly, it's public information. The more I do that, the more the client feels confident I'm doing everything right. Because here's the, here it is. We're right at the very crucial point, everyone. I now need the account number. Without that account number, I can't do anything. I don't get paid. So I have built in my mind the entire reason that I do the application, the order I do it, is to get to this point where for the client, it feels very natural for them to give me the account number. Now, I actually will have this thing open right here, ready to go. I've already typed in 121-000-358. And they're going to give me an account number. I'm going to put an amount. Let's say it's 100 bucks. It's going to be Samuel Suites. You know, whatever the name of the client is. This It doesn't matter actually what this is. Um, but you're going to put in their email address and then their phone number. Okay. And what you're waiting for is that account number. So you're looking right here and you're waiting for them. And they say, hey, my account number is 2244. So you put in 2244, you hit tab and you say, hey, can you give that to me one more time? And they go, sure, it's 2244. And you go, okay, 2244. When you hit that, you now should be over here putting in 2244. You believe you have the routing number right, count number right. Client is not seeing the screen. Please do not let the client see the screen because if they do, they're gonna ask you questions and they're probably gonna be questions you don't have answers to. Because when I click verify now, it's going to go through, it's going to look, and it's going to tell me, uh-oh, we have a fail. Do you want the client to see that? Probably not. Even if it said passed, everything good, you don't want the client to see it because it's going to give you that code. And if I remember, everybody downloaded the code document, right, from the chat yesterday. So now you know what is going on. And if it's a regional player, a smaller credit union, as an example, you may get a yellow code, but for the client, they're not going to understand why they're getting yellow. You do, but the client won't. <clears throat> so let's assume I did this, everything went through, you click verify, and it comes back with pass. That's great. Now you know that the information here is absolutely correct. By the way, you must do the bank verification 100% of the time. If you do not do a bank verification, AO will kick back and you will not get paid on that deal. So just do it 100% of the time. So once it's in there, if we remember now, Ashley, I think she asked, is checking her savings. And then she said what? 
She said, you have a certain number of days that are available to you to select as your draw date. She didn't say just pick a date from 1 to 28 or 1 to 30, right? She said it in a very unique way. Ben, do you know why she said it in a unique way? Alternative choice. Just making them pick the date. and I'm Not making them pick the date, but giving them what they can she's pick. Giving them a range of dates, but do you know why she's doing that? Uh, give them some control, maybe? I don't know. No, no. It, it's a, it, You're not even close, but that's okay. I'm going to show you. Uh, hopefully, I can show you exactly how that works. So if you open up your new agent packets and you come here to page 46, you have bank draft dates. So here's the interesting thing. Today is what, the 16th? No, the yeah, it's the 16th. So if you look at this bank draft date page and you go to the 16th, it tells you you can select from the 17th through the 28th. But what does it what does it mean? What does it actually mean? So here's what happens. The first draft will come out on whatever date that happens from now on the next two days, three days, four days. What did it actually say? Five business days, right? We typically say within 24 to 48 hours, that way the client knows they have to have the money in the account. So today is the 16th. If I tell you that, hey, I'm the client and I needed to come out the first of every month and you come down to the requested draw date and you put in the first and you hit tab, it will now tell you that based on your draft date, the very next time you're gonna be drafted. So let's look at that date. It's September 1st of 2023. Let's go to Brooke Pickett. Brooke, is that a problem for the client to have a draft come out on September 1st? Is it a problem? I'm not sure. All right, Brooke, you're my client. I'm telling you that we're going oh, to take yes. $155 in the next three to five days. Yeah, maybe like because everything comes out on the first. Well, I mean, that could be the case, but yeah. that's actually not the issue, Brooke. The okay. issue, this is what Brooke will do. I guarantee you this was what Brooke will do. We'll take out $155, let's say, on Friday, the 18th. Oh, I see. We'll turn around in two weeks, we're going to take out another yeah. $155. Even if Brooke tells me, yeah, I don't have a problem. Take it on that day. It's fine. I guarantee you, if Brooke is married, has a significant other, and they're looking for that $155 to do whatever, and it's not there, they're going to be like, hey, what's going on? So then I'm going to get a phone call from Brooke that says, hey, you hit my account twice within 30 days. And I'm going to say, but Brooke, you know, we talked about it. You said, you, and you're like, yeah, but I, you need to refund me the money. Right? Because she needs the $155 back. So I go, okay, Brooke, let me see what I can do. So I'm going to call corporate services. And I'm going to say, hey, you guys made a mistake. You took the money out on the first. And corporate services is going to tell me, well, yeah, you told us to. And we know that because right there, we gave you a message that says the next time it gets taken out is the first. So I'm going to call up Brooke. I'm going to be really apologetic. And I'm going to say, hey, Brooke, let's role play, Brooke. Brooke, I'm really so sorry, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to refund your money back. Well, I need that money. I had right. plans for that money. I totally understand what you're saying, but unfortunately, uh, the way that we set it up, in fact, the money would be taken out on the first. Okay. So now what does Brooke do? I think that I just... I might not even want to do business with you guys anymore. There you go. And that's what happens, right? People like Brooke will go, well, if you can't even get this right and you took too much money, for, how am I supposed to believe that you're going to actually pay it out when I'm dead, right? So what will Brooke do? She'll cancel. And then I, as the agent, don't want her to cancel because I got paid on it, number one. Number two, I'm going to get the renewals off it, hopefully in the future. So I don't want her to cancel, but AIL is telling me, yeah, we don't refund the money. So what option do I have, Brooke? What could I possibly do? 
personally send her the money? That's yeah. exactly what I did. So I had a $225 policy. So 225 times 12 means that that thing was worth $2,700 to me. So in my mind, I have to weigh, is it worth me keeping the commission I got on 227 or 2000, <clears throat> sorry, $2,700, or was it worth it to me to sell that client $222? Guess what I did? Zell. So I sold her the money. Now, in all states, you know, in probably 85% of the states, you're not allowed to induce somebody to buy something in the insurance world by giving them money or giving them a discount. Okay, you're not allowed to do that. However, in this circumstance, I'm not inducing her to buy. She bought and I didn't have to give her anything. It turns out I made a mistake. And the mistake I made is that I allowed her to pick a date that would cause the money to be taken out twice within 30 days. The only way to rectify that situation so she doesn't cancel is I need to give her the money out of my pocket. Now, is it worth it to me? Absolutely, because on $2,700 times 0.5 times 0.75 is equal to $1,000, $1,012. So if I have to give up 22, sorry, $222 to keep the thousand, I'm going to do it. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Brooke, does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. So don't ever do that. Don't be put in a position where you got to give away your hard earned money. Make sure you get the draft date correct. So the way that you do it is you can take a look at the sheet here and what it tells you if today again is the 16th you can pick a draft date anywhere from the 17th through the 28th you're fine any other date outside of that you will then incur a second hit within 30 days so basically the math is this 14 days from whatever date you're in you can do it up to that point so if i want to do it 14 and 16 is the 28th because you can only go up to the 28th because February only has 28 days, I could put in 28, hit tab, and it says the next time will be September 28th. That's more than 30 days out, correct? Now the client's happy. They're like, hey, I, I got an extra few days. So if I want a different date, I can put the 17th. Hit tab. Ooh, September 17th. That's more than 30 days. I'm still okay. So does everyone understand how that works? Because invariably, one student in every class will run into this problem at some point. They'll forget about the draft dates. Okay, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to put the first. And that means it's going to happen on September 1st. Oh, yeah, no, I can't do that. So we're going to put, what, the 26th. How about that? Will that work? 926 is 30 days more than August 16th, so I'm good. All right, so that's completely done. And I'm going to say cancel. I don't want to change the billing. So now I'm good there. So I have the social security number, the driver's license. I have the banking information now. And on the banking information, I've done the bank verification without the client seeing. So now I'm golden. And now what I want to do, sorry, let's come back here. I think everything is tight and ready to go. Barbara, what is your question? Barbara, what is your question? Um, the people who have their checks deposited in their, you know, um, expense accounts that they pay their bills with on, you know, a certain day during the month, whether it's, you know, retirement check or whatever. Um, what happens if it's like not within that time frame that they, they're like, if they say, okay, well, I want it on the 15th of the month every month because that's when I put my money and you into said, my no problem. We can do that. However, I can't do it on the first uh, bank draft because I want to make sure you don't get hit twice. So we're going to put this date in between the 17th through the 28th. And then after that, I can change it to any date that you want because I can go in later and make the change with them. Okay. So the first one always has to be done correctly. Even if they tell you, hey, I totally understand, I, I get the fact that I'm going to get hit twice in a month, it doesn't matter because they'll forget that they said that or their better half are the ones that actually manage the money and they'll be like, no, no, we need to get refunded. 
So don't put yourself in that position. Only give them a certain amount of days to choose from, just like Ashley did. They have to pick one of those days. If they say, well, it's got to be on a different date, say, hey, we can do that in the second month. I just can't do it in the first one because of the way the draft works. Okay? Okay. All right. So we have all that done. We think we actually have everything filled out on this particular client. Everything kind of looks good. I think everything's answered there. Okay. Everything looks good. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to page one. I'm going to validate. When I click validate, it's going to tell me everything that I potentially missed. If you remember, Ashley actually did that. And it turns out I have one error. And what is the one error I have? Down here it says the driver's license format is invalid for the state. So I come up here and I realize that that fake number I made for the state of California, that's not a valid driver's license. Right? It knows that. So it's asking me to put in the correct one. So I'm going to do C333. Seven two seven seven. Now, when I validate, hopefully, it'll come back and give me everything that I need. It comes back and it says, oh, there's no errors on the page. It doesn't mean all the information is correct. It just means it's in the right format and I'm not missing anything. Now, when it did that, it also, over here, gave me all kinds of stuff, right? So it gave me the accelerated death benefit forms. It gave me all these other things. So these are additional forms that have to be looked at. At this point, if you have glasses here, it means you have looked at this form. Every form at this point has to have glasses displayed in the little icon. So you just need to double click these and open them and just look at them. And you'll see now glasses show up. Now glasses show up and you just keep going all the way through the process. Now, because we're here, this is the interesting part. This run-on sentence, it's actually not a run-on sentence, it just feels like it, but here we go. I authorize any health plan, physician, healthcare professional, hospital, clinic, laboratory, pharmacy, pharmacy benefit manager, medical facility, other insurance company, consumer reporting agency, medical information bureau, or other healthcare provider that has provided tr payment, treatment, or services to me on, on my behalf to disclose my entire medical record and any other protected health information concerning me to the American Income Life Insurance Company, its agents, employees, and representatives. That, my friends, is the whole ballgame. In order to get insurance from any insurance company, you're going to have to sign a document that has a phrase just like that. And once that's done, I, as the insurance company, can now pull from the 15 different sources of information, including the Medical Information Bureau, everything that there was known about you that any insurance company or facility, any insurance company that paid for services to provide medical treatment to you or any medical facility that provided treatment for you. I get it all. So if you lie to me, we're going to know. So we have something called the Medical Information Bureau. Does anybody know what that is? Courtney Shuck, do you know what the Medical Information Bureau is? It's pretty much where they have like all your medical records. Like okay, they can so talk to the providers records. and see Which if part of the government them? runs it? That I don't remember. Oh, well, I'm gonna share a little thought with you. It's not run by the government at all. It's service. run by all of the insurance companies. That's great. So think about the racket that they've done. It's awesome, right? They all got together and created, hey, the Medical Information Bureau, and then we'll have everybody sign this document, which means that we will now share all the information medically about anybody who's provided authorization to anybody that requests it for a valid reason. It's a clearinghouse of data about each and every one of you. You're all in there. Now, that's just one of the areas we get information. We've got 14 others. And, and you know that it's saying there, hold on, consumer reporting agency. Oh, my goodness. So when you apply for medical insurance, I'm sorry, for life insurance from any life insurance provider, guess what? They can get access to everything. So if you want to stay off the grid, you don't buy insurance. <laughs> basically okay so this one opens up all you have to do is look at it and then the spectacles show up hiv consent because we're in california at least on the way i'm using uh if we run a blood panel on you we one of the things we screen for is the hiv virus in california in particular 
we can't just call you up and say, hey, it turns out that uh, you tested positive. No, what we have to do is give the information to an authorized medical professional that you've identified, and then they sit down with you, tell you your status, and give you medical treatment options. So that's required by law in California. That's why that is there. Then you have the oral specimen. On this one, all I want you to do is type in NA for non-applicable. In the old days, when we used to have to drive out to people's homes, we'd carry this kit, and this kit would have a number, and we would then take a swab and swab the inside of your cheek, and then we put it with some solution into a tube, and the application that was physically filled out along with that tube would be sent off to the home office for processing. So Courtney Shuck, you're on a roll. Why in the world will we take a swab of your cheek? What are we looking for? Um, because that's where your saliva can um, identify if you do have any HIV or any other genetic conditions. No. No. So while you're actually accurate, that's not how the insurance company use it. We would use the swab of your cheek to check for nicotine because it's in your bloodstream and your cells, all that good stuff. But you're very right. There's, we've progressed to the point where we can do a lot with the uh, DNA and things of that nature, but we're not checking your DNA when we do that cheek yeah, swab. Like nicotine and alcohol use. Okay. Wow, that would be really freaked me out, right? They know everything about me and now they have my DNA on record. Holy mackerel. Anyway, so I want you to put NA because we don't take oral specimens anymore. And then you come down to the uh, spouse, you can put NA in here as well. <clears throat> and close that one. Now we're at pay your information. This is going to be the name of the person who is in slot A that's responsible for paying on the policy. So you can close that once it's open. Replacement. This is saying <clears throat> that I do not have existing life insurance policies <clears throat> or annuity contracts that are going to be replaced. That's what it means. So they may have policies, <clears throat> but we're not going to replace them. So we're always going to click do not. Okay. And then on the second one, we're going to play, uh, put do not. And the last one is a secondary addressee. So we're open that up and it says, okay, for past premium. So when I first started, this didn't exist. We weren't worried about this. But here's a scenario. Sam Sweet, insurance director, calls up Rebecca Rice's family members and says, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of Rebecca. I haven't been able to get a hold of her. So if I call up her family members right now, Rebecca, what would your family members say to me? Um, they probably wouldn't give you the information. I don't know. They'll probably let you know that I'm calling yeah, and that way. They'll, they'll call me. Right? <clears throat> okay, so that sounds fine. But Rebecca, what if I did exactly the same thing, but I did it at the height of COVID and you lived in New York? What would your family members do then? Um, Remember, it's the height of COVID. You're in New York. What was happening at that point in time? Um, they would try to find where I was. No, nope. people were dying by the thousands, Rebecca. So if mm -hmm. I'm calling your loved ones, trying to find you, even if I don't even say that, if I just say, hey, I'm an insurance director with American Income, Rebecca's Life Insurance Company, immediately family members would think what? I'm dead. Exactly. So can you imagine the number of complaints that every insurance company got uh, sent to their state commissioners at the height of COVID when you had someone like me trying to call somebody asking about the location of such and such? A huge number. So what we ended up doing is negotiating with the insurance commissioners like, hey, because typically what would happen is we would call beneficiaries, right? Because that's who we had for emergency contacts. We would have beneficiaries, husband, wife, daughter, son, family member, whatever. Those are the people who would freak out. So can you imagine, hey, my name is Sam Sweet. I'm insurance director with American Income Life, Rebecca's Life Insurance Company. It doesn't matter what I say after that. The blood pressure, everything's going through the roof and immediately people are thinking the worst, right? So to get around that and alleviate that pain, what we have is a second addressee. So now we're saying, hey, who can we reach out to? If for whatever reason we can't get a hold of you, who should we contact? This is yet another opportunity for you to create a referral. 
Yeah. Maybe a next door neighbor, maybe somebody just to make sure you're okay. If we can't get a hold of you, who do you want us to reach out to? Because I'm sure you don't want <clears throat> the beneficiaries to be called, particularly if there's a COVID uh, disaster again, right? And most people go, yeah, you're right. Why don't you call Bill, my neighbor? He knows when I go on vacation, stuff like that. Cool. Now I have another referral. And now I have a very good reason to call Bill, don't I? Hey, Rebecca gave me your name and information in the event of anything happened, blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? Okay, cool. By the way, she also sponsored you for the same benefits. Do you see how that works? Okay. So then we're going to fill this out and we're going to say Rebecca because she's been so nice. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, and I'll just call you Rios, all right? And then it doesn't matter what I put in here or here or here or here or a phone number. Okay, so we're going to fill that out. And again, this is an art. You don't have to do that. You can put the husband and wife if you want to do it. In my mind, though, I'm going to try to collect every referral possible because I start figuring out how to get referrals from the moment I get somebody on Zoom until I finally let them go. The entire time I'm looking for opportunities to get referrals. So I'm here. I think all that's done. Now I have everything there except for this one. Got to open that one up. And now I have glasses everywhere. Okay. So now I'm going to close that. So before we go to the next step, the next thing I want to do, though, is show you a super combo compared to a senior combo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in, click on applications, I'm going to go and add, and let's take a look at what the senior life combo looks like. So it's going to open up here right now, and this is what it looks like compared side by side. So you still have the affiliation up here. You have the name, but notice we don't have any children. This is for people 60 or older. Okay. You're still going to say, I saw on the date of birth. All that information is still the same. Address all of that. The primary beneficiary, contingent beneficiaries, and occupation and duties. All this stuff is the same all the way through here, right? And you give the email address. Is the insurance applied for, intended to replace? The answer is no. So you don't have to fill anything out here. And now you ask, are you a US citizen? Same way you ask it right there. Now, here, there's all kinds of stuff I can sell. Tons of it, right? Whole life, premium, executive, select life, uh, writers, terms. I mean, it's all over the map. But on this one, the only thing I can really sell is a graded whole life policy. That's it. And what is the max Barbara Wambacher of graded whole life that I can give to a senior? The maximum amount of whole life. Um, isn't that, I have to look at my notes and say, I think it's $10,000, isn't it? No. 34,000 something. 34,999. Oh, 34,000, okay. It's, I yeah. have it in my notes. And it's in the new agent packet as well. So we know that that's the max I can give. And then I'm going to put the amount on there. And if I have a proposed B, I can put it on there as well. I can do an accident insurance policy. So I can do the A71. But in the in the situation where there's a husband and wife and the wife is younger than 60, but the husband is 60 or older, you would actually put the husband over here on B, make wife the owner, and then put him on the family right there for the a71. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody? Does it make mm -hmm. sense to anyone? What I just said. Can you repeat it, please? <laughs> you're killing me, Brooke. Absolutely <laughs> killing me. I said if you're if you have a married couple and one of them is under the age of 60, the other one's over the age of 60, but you want to offer the A71 to the family, the wife who's under 60 would be here in A. The husband would be in B, so that way you could do this right here, the A sub one and offer to both of them. However, B here would be blank because you would have this form up for him since he's over 60, okay? All right, then you're gonna fill out the graded amount. You're gonna, you could give them an accident insurance policy. Let's say you're talking to a couple that are both over the age of 60, you're gonna use this form the senior life combo, you're not going to use the super combo, or you're talking to one person, you can sell them the <clears throat> A71 and put it in right here. Same concept now, uh, A71, Medicaid eligibility, and age 65, same thing that you would see right here, except you don't have the H34 
nor do you have critical illness. So you do not have hospital indemnity and critical illness for somebody 60 year older. And the reason for that is when you're 60 year older, the likelihood you're going to need that is much higher than somebody younger. Okay. Now, that's just some slight, in my mind, cosmetic differences in the first page. Where it really matters is the second page. So on the se second page of the super combo, you have everything under the sun. We need to know about everything about the client, as well as right here, we have 26, which is the catch-all. Hey, is there anything that we haven't disclosed or we haven't asked you, you need to disclose it. When we look at the same page for the senior, it's really straightforward it's very simple if any answer is yes other than two which is the tobacco question if the answer is yes to anything else it's an auto decline plain and simple auto decline the other thing to remember is over here we want to know about everything we want to write everything down we have this uh medical form that we fill out right there and we put everything possibly under the sun in it. On this form with the senior, I only want to ask the question that is written here. I do not want, nor do I need any additional information. And I will tell a client that. I'm like, hey, Ben, we're gonna go ahead and go through this. I only need you to answer the question exactly as it's, I tell it or I read it to you. I don't need to know any additional information. And I'm going to ask, have you been rejected? Nope. Have you used tobacco? Nope. Do you have terminal illness, heart, lung, or transplant, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through this. So if he gives me a bunch of no's, he is qualified. So we have to understand what that means. I do not want to know any additional information other than the question. So if they start telling me, oh, I got diabetes, and I go, you have what? Oh, I have diabetes. Oh, okay. And I take insulin. Do I care? Yeah, I mean, I care because I want to talk to them. I want to help them out. But I don't need to know the answer up here. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't need to know that. I don't need to record it. The only other thing I have to do is down here, only on the senior life combo, I need to put down the name of every medication they take. It does not matter what the medication is for. Okay. I just need to list the name. I don't want to know what it was prescribed for. I don't want to know frequency and I don't want to know dosage. I don't want to know any of that. I just want to know the names of the actual medications. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this open. This is my new agent packet. I'm going to go to page 45. And if they give me a name of a medication that's on this list, then and only then will it be submitted as a trial. If it's not here, I'm not worried. If they tell me I'm taking insulin, what did I tell you? What happens with insulin? I said it today. Do you guys remember? Yeah. Insulin is a little decline, but only for somebody under the age of 60. If you're 60 or older, let's go back and look to see, do I ever ask the question if you have, uh, let me look here. Do you have diabetes? Uh, oh, no. I never asked the question, do you have diabetes? So if the answer to all these questions is no, with the exception of number two, they qualify for insurance. Now, you might ask, well, how in the heck are they able to do that? Because we have already ascertained what our risk profile is. First of all, we cap at $34,999. They can't get any more insurance from us than that. The other way we mitigate risk is we grade the policy. So in years one, two, and three, they only get paid out, <clears throat> the beneficiaries, uh, 25, 50, and 75% respectively. If you live more than three years after we give you a policy after age of 60, the likelihood is you're going to live for another 10. But we do know that people die within years one, two, and three, so we reduce the payout. Whew. Yes, Melissa, you have a question. What can I do for you? And this just might be my lack of um, 
sitting on calls, so I, I haven't heard them yet, so I don't know. When you say auto decline, do we proceed with a call with that, uh, just us knowing that the, the, the app isn't going to go through? Do we give the... It depends on the reason for the auto decline. So, may, so, so we, as an example, they're under 60, they're taking insulin. We know that it's going to be an auto decline. Do we go through with it or do we just stop the call there? So no, when we finish the call, we never just stop it, right? Well, I know. But well, if, yeah. Let's say it was you and okay. you're 59 years old, you're taking insulin for diabetes. Okay. What I'm going to say is, hey, Melissa, unfortunately at this time, we can't extend the permanent benefits to you. However, I know based on everything else you told me, you would qualify once you hit 60 because the qualifications for insurance lowers once you're 60 years old. Okay. So what I'm going to do, Melissa, is I'm going to give you a call back in six months because that's going to be your 60th birthday. And we're going to go ahead and get this policy set up for you then. OK. okay. And Melissa will be like, OK, now different situation. Let's say, Melissa, you're under the age of 60, but you just were arrested for a felony a year ago. We'll say, hey, Melissa, unfortunately, at this time, we can't extend the permanent benefits to you. And it has to do with the fact that uh, people who have a felony arrest, doesn't matter about conviction, the arrest itself is enough of a deterrent. We can't provide coverage. And that, and then we would just wrap up the call. And, and then we would finish up the call. And you saw what Ashley did. We go to the report card. We fill out the report card and call it good. Okay. okay. That's kind of, because you kept saying it's an auto decline, but I wasn't sure like what that meant. Um, so that's yeah, why so auto means we can't provide coverage for whatever the reason is, but okay. you have to take into account the reason, the timing, and whether or not you can recover from it. So okay. somebody who's got a decline for a whole life policy may still be eligible for an A71. So when I'm talking to right. a family, let's say the husband's in that situation, I will include the husband on the A71, but I won't extend the whole life policy to him. Okay. So he still has coverage. It's just accidental only. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So, so this, this screen here, we've gone through all of this. We know if the answers are no to everything, we're good to go. Down here, we must put the name of every medication that they're taking. Here on the super combo, we don't have to do that. And the reason why is because we have the medical information where we write down every medicine, uh, medication they're taking. So you don't have to put it in the remarks section. Okay. So we've done all that. We're here. Everything looks good. Everything works exactly the same way after that. Okay. So it's much easier to qualify somebody for insurance if they're a senior. Remarkably so. And so most people who start off like, well, I don't want to sell the seniors because they don't have any money. So here's the thing I really want you to think about. If I'm a senior and if I don't have that much money, what do I, what am I acutely aware of? Does anybody know? I'm closer to dying than I'm closer to being born. I know that. I'm motivated because if I'm talking to you and I buy into what you're telling me, if I feel there's value, I'm going to figure out some way to not pass on the funeral fund expenses to my family. That's why most seniors buy insurance. It's not to protect against lost income or mortgage protection. It's purely for funeral and final expenses. So the cost of the funeral and final expenses for a senior is up here, whereas the cost for a super combo is usually lower. So what that means for all of you is that you actually make more money selling to seniors than you do selling to other people. It's just the nature of the beast, right? Because the cost has gone up because we don't expect you to live as long as somebody who's like 30. So just something to consider that you have a highly motivated group of people that you're targeting, you know, in the market that are uh, very willing to pay the money so they don't pass along the liability to their kids. Does that make sense to you, Brooke? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So we went through all this. I don't need any of this. So I'm just going to close it and I'm going to remove it. So come over here and click remove. Okay. So now that part's done. Now I'm back over here. I think everything's completely finished. Everything has little glasses. So I'm very happy. I'm going to close this and I'm going to click next. 
Now, if in fact I've done all of this correctly, the very next thing that's going to happen is it will come up and it will tell me, hey, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll say, hey, by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Client, or actually it comes out and says I have an error. Ooh, I didn't put the date in that the prescription was here. So I'm going to say 11 of 2020. So you see, it will tell you when it's missing a critical piece. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. And I'm going to click next again, and it's going to go through and check everything one more time to make sure I put everything in the way uh, it expected me to. Doesn't mean the information is accurate, just means it's in there. Now, this message comes up and it says, hey, by submitting the form above, you agree to receive periodic automated text message communications from AIL. All that means is we're going to send stuff to you as a applicant. If you do not want it, all you have to do is send back a text that says stop, quit, or unsubscribe. This means, if this comes up, that you've done everything right so far. So that's a good sign, right? I'm going to click OK. Now this thing comes up. 100% of the time, you should have it say virtual with DocuSign. Even if you go into someone's home, do virtual with DocuSign. Because that's how we sign everything now. Here, I want you to put your email address right now. So in my case, I'm going to put my email address, samuelsweetail at gmail.com. I'm going to hit tab. It's going to ask me to fill it in again, just like it did with the bank account information. So Sammy Sweet, AIL at gmail.com and click OK. Then it's going to ask for the next thing, which is the spouse. Here's what I do. This is an art. Even if the spouse doesn't have a separate email address, I know it gets complicated, particularly when we're selling to older people. If there's multiple email addresses flying around, so I will typically send it to the same email address. In this case, I want you to do that as well. Type in your email address again, please. Yes, Melissa, while I'm doing that, how can I help you? I'm sorry. I don't have the glasses on all my documents. Is there a reason uh, for that? You have to share your screen with me because I don't know what you're talking about. So... Like you had all the glasses there? I don't have the glasses. You don't. Uh, close the super combo behind you. And close all those other, the other form behind you as well and the other one. So you have all those forms. Just, That's why yeah. you don't have glasses because they're open now. Uh -huh. nope. Now you need to open everything that doesn't have glasses. That doesn't? Yeah, because you got to get, you have to tell the system that you've looked at it. So you need to double click it. Oh, and that's when it has glasses. Oh, because that means you looked at it. Is that correct? That means you looked at uh -huh. it. Okay. Uh -huh. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay. So now I'm here and I am going to enter my email one last time. And I implore all of you to do this. Put your email in here as you follow along with me. Very important that you do that. So now you're going to click OK. And now it says it's done, basically. So once you're finished and both emails are filled out here, you're going to click submit. When you click submit, the next thing the system is going to do is it's going to look at all the forms and go, hey, Sam, by the way, you need to sign these things. OK, so everywhere I have glasses now, and the previous screen, it meant I need to look at it or that I have looked at it. Now it means I need to look at it. So each one of these forms I have glasses means I need to open it. So I'm going to double click it and I need to sign it. Notice now this is in gray. If I go to page one, it's all grayed out. I can't make any changes at this point because it's locked. Okay. So down here it says signature required. Okay. Where is that? On the super combo, the signature is always on page two and it's right there. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on the X and it says, hey, I've reviewed this document. If I sign my name in the line below, I agree that I co it constitutes my electronic signature and it is legally binding. So I'm going to type in my name, Samuel J. Sweet, and I'm going to click sign. But when I do that, I get this error that says the signature does not match the application. And that's because my last name is Sweet, S-W-E-E-T. And if we take our cursor and come over here, the agent last name is Train. So T-R-A-I-N doesn't match my last name. So when you actually have your profile set up, you won't have this error. It only comes up in the training environment, okay? 
So you're going to go ahead and say, yes, I wish to proceed. And now look what it says. Samuel J. Sweet and script. It has the date and it has the time. And then I do it again. Only this time when I click on the next place, it just says, hey, do you want to apply your signature? I apply it and now it shows up there. See, the time is off now by a minute because it took me a minute to actually do it. What else, Brooke, does the signature embed in the document that you can't see? Any what idea? Embed the document. The date, maybe? No, the date's right there. 816. Oh, can... You can see it. Yeah, I'm trying to get to that screen still, but I'm not sure. It includes geolocation data. What the heck does that mean? It means it includes the IP address. Oh. Or IP address of your computer. Why is that a big deal? I'm going to share with you. Let's assume that a client calls me up and says, hey, I want to do this deal. I get them on Zoom. Everything looks good. I sell the thing. And then the client goes, hey, Sam, I'm really busy right now. I can't get my email to work. Can I just give you my login to my email? And that way, when the documents come through, you can just sign on my behalf. And I go, sure, I'll be happy to do that for you because I know you want to buy it. So I go ahead and do that and I sign the document. Everything's good because the client wanted it. AIL has no idea that I signed on behalf of the client. Everything is fine. Worst case scenario, client calls me up and says, hey, Sam, I didn't want this to go through. I only wanted to think about it. Why did you sign it? And I go, well, you told me to. Well, yeah, I changed my mind. <laughs> that happens, right? People change their mind. So, like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and kill the deal. But let's say he didn't call me. Let's say he got this and we hit his bank account and he's like, I don't know what's going on. I never signed this thing. I'm going to make a complaint. So he goes and makes a complaint to American Income that, hey, I had somebody sign a document. I didn't do it. That's not my signature. American Income Life, first of all, has no idea that this happened, none whatsoever, but they do know that they can go back and pull the geolocation data. And if they see that the IP address <laughs> for when I signed it is exactly the same as the IP address for when the client signed it, but I'm supposed to be in California and the client was in Florida, what do you think will happen next, Melissa? You're going to get in really big trouble. Yeah, well, it's, the no, policy is going to be voided. First of all, you're going to get fired. Yeah. So big trouble may be coming. You're going to get fired because you fraudulently signed something you didn't. You violated your license and another thing. Then you're then it gets reported to your uh, your resident state and your license will probably be revoked. That's the least of your problems. Okay. So the majority of your problems is this. Let's say you talk to a husband and wife. They wanted you to do this. You sign on their behalf, and then the husband dies. Ah. So you fraudulently sign this thing, and every time you put your signature on this document, it is fraud. So you have many accounts of fraud. So theoretically, now you have exposure uh, with the criminal authority saying every single time it could be a count against you. That's not even the most extent of your problems, right? The extent of your problems is if somebody died and you were doing this, who is the individual on the hook for the policy? Melissa, who's on the hook? You are? You are, not the company, not AO, not your management, you. Well, Sam told us to get this E&O insurance, so I'm protected. Well, here's the thing. E&O insurance only covers when you're negligent, not grossly negligent. When you, not, you know, when you forge something or when you sign fraudulently, that is considered gross negligent, gross negligence rather. And the E&O companies will not cover that. Meaning that, yeah, you're probably going to be chased after from the authorities and charged with some felonies because each count is a felony. But even worse than that is if anybody died in the process, you're going to have to pay restitution and all that money. We had a guy a number of years ago who did exactly that. What he was doing is he was fraudulently filling out docu uh, 
he would talk to clients, but then he would just have them buy when they didn't realize they were buying. He finally got caught. We fired him. Remarkably enough, the authorities in that state didn't go after him. But guess who did go after him? American Income Life went after him. Yes. Over $2 million. And guess what? They got every dime back. So the moral of this little story is don't sign anything unless you know what the heck you're signing and never sign on behalf of somebody else, ever. There's no need for you to sign on behalf of anybody else. All right, so we've got that filled out on this page. If you want to check to make sure I did it right, you can come back up here, click on validate, and when you do, you see there's no errors, okay? So now you need to go to each one here that has glasses and you need to sign. So you just click there and you say apply signature. And now the uh, check mark shows up. So we're going to do that for all of them. And then once that's done, all the signatures will have been applied appropriately. So we go through that, say apply signature, close that one, accelerated death benefit, apply the signature, close that one, and hopefully the last one. Boom, there we go. Now again, remember it takes 10, 12 minutes to do this because you get used to it, you move quickly. And the client gets a copy of every single one of these when we send it to them. So now that is completely done. I'm going to go ahead and click next. When I click next, this comes up. This is very important because if you determine that somebody on this uh, application is going to be submitted as a trial, this is where you do it. So let's assume that Richard Reyes needs to be submitted as a trial for whatever reason. We're going to come over here. We're going to change it from standard submit to trial without money. When we do that, the money still remains here. The total premium remains the same. However, we're going to take out the 6007 because that's trial. And then the initial uh, bank draft is only going to be for $95 and a penny. If we kept that as standard, it would be 155 and 155. Okay. But if we trial it, it's still 155, but we take out the 61st. And so we're only going to take out $95 because for the contract to be valid, consideration needs to be given. We need to take money out of your account, and then we're legally obligated to pay out in the event of your death. But on a trial, we don't do that. We don't take money from you because you do not have coverage until the trial is successfully completed. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say standard submit, and I'm going to click next. When I click next, I'm going to have some things that come up. These things were displayed for the client in the home. Because we're doing everything virtually, you do not have to display all this stuff to the client. If you remember, Ashley didn't show all this stuff, right? So you just close it out. All you got to do is close that out. You definitely don't want to go through this because you don't want to try to explain all these numbers because none of these numbers match what that person will actually get based on their own application. So You're you not sharing the screen with them at this point, Sam? No, you, you have to share the screen. Just tell them, hey, all these forms you're going to get when it's sent to you. Okay. Okay. Now here it's going to ask, do you want anybody else who could benefit from our program? When you click continue, again, this is going to be the sponsorship program. When we used to be in the home, this is how we do it. You already did all this with HP Pro, right? So you don't need to go through this. And you just tell them, hey, we did everything already with the HP Pro application, so I'm going to go ahead and close it. However, when you get to this screen, we actually need to go through it with the client. And you're basically going to say, hey, I'm going to do everything I can to get this policy issued. You are probably going to receive a phone call asking you to review the questions that I asked. It takes about three to four or five minutes. It's like a survey. Now, if they determine that we need to get additional information from you or a blood or urine specimen, we'll arrange an appointment for someone to come out and do that. And that's going to be at our cost and at your convenience. Now, we will be requesting medical records. If for some reason the facility or doctor doesn't reply in a timely fashion, I will get notified and then I will reach out with you and we'll try to get together to get the medical professional providing the information. Now, there's three things that will happen based on what we did today. The first one is everything goes through the way that I described it. Second thing is you might get rated. And what that typically means is that the company looks or underwriting rather looks at your situation and maybe I quoted you a certain amount. They may go a few dollars higher because of the risk. If that happens, They'll let me know and then I'll call you and we'll work it through together. Now, so for all of you know, again, if somebody is rated, they get two choices. They either keep the coverage at the same amount and they pay the higher premium or they keep the premium at the same amount and we lower the coverage amount simply because of the risk factor. 
Okay. The third option is a, a declination, but you would already know if they're going to be declined more often than not, and you wouldn't have even gotten to this point. And then six to eight weeks, you're going to issue that. Now, all this down here, I don't share with the client because I have other ways of doing that. Okay. So I'm just going to, I just show them this and then I'm going to click continue. And then I have to play this video. And when I play the video, I kill it because it's talking about a career opportunity. I've already know, spent time asking questions. I already know whether or not if they might be interested in doing what I do. So this comes up A -I -L. and then I kill it, it goes away. And then the recruiting referral comes up. I kill that as well, because if I feel that they want to be a recruit, I will give their name and information to my upline. And then last but not least, please donate a non-perishable food item. Again, if I'm in the home, that's what we ask for. So I click okay and now, and only now, I can click all of these because I've now done all of this. Until I get through everything, I can't click any of those. Once I'm completely uh, finished, I can click those. Now I can go down here and click next. Whew, I'm almost there, I think. So I'm here. It's now locking and packaging everything for the client signature. And then it says the application package is ready to be signed. Here's what I do. I say, hey, Ben, everything's ready to go. What I want you to do is check your email. I'm going to send this off to you right now. So go ahead and pull your email up. It may take 30 minutes, sorry, 30 seconds to a minute for that to come up. I then click next. So now he is looking in his email. At the same time, I'm looking at this and say, okay, we'll set successful or signing. I'm going to click OK. And now I will probably close this out and no longer share my screen because now I just want to talk to him. But I'm waiting for him to look up his email because I want to know if, in fact, he got an email from American Income Life. Now, if all of you put your email in the way that I asked you and you follow along with me, you will get an email from American Income Life. And how do I know that? Because here is the email that I got from American Income Life. And it looks just like this. It says, hey, Richard Reyes, guess what? It's time for you to sign. And I go, oh, cool. This is what the client sees. You can't see it as the agent, but I had you do this so that you can actually see what the client does. So you're going to click, the client's going to click on review documents. When the client clicks on review documents, a tab will come up on the browser. It'll look like this. It's at DocuSign. It's going to say, hey, first, I agree to use electronic records and signatures. So I have to click on that. And then I have to go over here and click on continue. When I do that, now it's ready to start for me to apply my signature. So what you tell them to do is, hey, I want you to click the start. Now, if they're familiar with DocuSign, it's the same way every time. But sometimes there's people who are not. So you're going to say, I want you to click on the start button. It should be in yellow on the left-hand side. They click on it, and now it says sign. So what I want you to do is click on sign. Whoop, go back. I want you to click on the down arrow once there's sign. When you do that, it says, okay, do you want to adopt your signature or do you want to write in by name? You can do either way. I want you to always to have them click on adopt and sign. Now, when I do that, it then goes to the next one. And now when I click on that sign, it's just adopting and putting it everywhere and signing my name. You see my name is signed right there as the agent. Now I'm going to sign. It's going to be for Richard Reyes. And now see it says Richard Reyes. It's completely done. And I asked the client, are you finished? Because up in the upper right-hand corner should have a yellow box that says the word finished. Go ahead and click on it. When that happens, it's going to package all the signatures up, and then it's going to give you this, save a copy of your document. What this is doing is it's going to allow the client to create a free DocuSign account. They do not have to do this. So I always say, no, you can just say, no, thanks, because we're going to send everything to you. This is really for people who have multiple DocuSigns they got to do every day, like a mortgage lender or something like that. So you don't need that. If you want it, you can, but it's not necessary. Just click no thanks. So let's say they go, okay, yeah, no thanks. And now they're good to go. And then you get this that says you finished signing. You will receive an email copy once everyone is signed. So they're going to get a copy of what they signed. Okay, everyone tracking with me so far. Then what happens, remember I was the first one I'm going to show another one. Okay, so I'm going to close this one out. And now another email came through. Only this time, that email is not for Richard. It's for uh, Julie, right? Because that's the other person that we had that come up. 
So the same email will come up. It'll say, Julie Reyes, please DocuSign. So she's going to look at it and say, click on review documents. And now this one will come up. And this one now is for Julie. Same concept, right? I'm going to say, I agree. I'm going to continue. I'm going to start. And now I'm going to click adopt my name. See right there, Julie Reyes, adopt and sign. And notice that I have a signature here, but on that first page, Richard already signed. Where is it? Where is he? Richard Reyes signed right there? Yeah. He's the, right? So he's already signed first and now she's signing. So she's going to say, sign everything. Everything looks good. I've signed everything. And now I'm done. Once I finish signing everything, you tell Julie, hey, on the upper right hand corner, should say finish. It does click finish. And it will go through and look at everything and say, hey, do you want to save a copy of the document? You say, no, thanks. And it says you finish signing an email copy was sent once everybody signed. So now I think everything is done, right? And everything is done there. And now I'm here. I'm looking at this, but I'm no longer sharing my screen. When everything is done, this is the email that they should get. Richard is the owner. Hey, all parties have signed the envelope or basically they've signed their application. So once the client tells you, yeah, I received that email. Once the client tells you, so you're staying on the spoon with the client because you want to make sure they sign everything. Once they tell you they have that email, what you're going to do is you're going to come over here. You're going to click on file, submit sales and sales status screen. When you click on that, you should now see right here if it was an actual client, not in our example, because it's training, so we never actually send it out. But if you were a client that was real and I was selling to you, and you said, hey, I got the email that says I'm done, right here, it should have some name, it should have my agent number, the number of forms, the total cash I'm collecting, and the sales age. All I have to do is click on that, and when I do it, the upload the impact button will no longer be grayed out. Why is that important? Because in this entire process, the entire process, American Income Life does not know that you've written an application at all. They have no idea. Everything is local on your computer, right? You haven't uploaded it to Impact yet. The moment you upload it to Impact though, it is removed from your computer forever. It's gone. It's uploaded to the cloud for the servers for American Income Life. And then and only then does American Income Life even know that there's an application. So best rule of thumb is when that is listed there, that particular application, highlight it and immediately upload it to impact. Immediately. There's no reason to wait. Now, your upline may have you wait for a variety of reasons, like there's contests. We want you to get credit and all that. That's totally fine if they give you direction to do that. But I want you to think about this. You're the insurance agent. If you're submitting somebody a standard and you're telling them, as soon as we pull money out of your account, the policy is active, the longer you hold that policy and don't send it to American Income Life, then that person theoretically doesn't have coverage. If they die in the next two or three days and they believe you told them that they would have coverage immediately, now you've got a problem, right? So just keep that in mind. In my, I don't care. For me, I upload everything immediately. I want it out of my, I want American Income Life to do whatever they're going to do with it. So once that's completely done, we're now finished. If we go back and look at the application package wizard, you'll see that Richard Reyes is still there waiting for signatures. Because that's the status that was there at the time that is received. And because this is in the training mode, it made it a little squirrely. If it is ready to transmit, meaning they've signed it and you've gotten that back, this code will say ready to transmit. And if you went to file, submit sales, you would see it right here. You'd highlight it and click upload to impact. The moment you do that though, you highlight upload the impact, then the Richard Reyes or whatever, whatever it is says ready to transmit, that will go away because it's no longer ready to transmit, it's gone. Okay, so now do we think we're done? Not quite because we need to do solidification. Everybody remember where the solidification stuff is at, correct? No one remembers? I don't remember. Do I remember? I do remember. Print. It's in the veteran 
script, right? It's the very last page of the veteran script. So if you go and open up your veteran script, see if I can do that. Uh, it's attachment four, right? And it looks like this. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom, there it is, solidification. And we saw Ashley do that. Hey, quiz time, what do we do today? How do you feel about everything? It's not as short-term for X, long-term. You know, read that and find some way that it makes sense for you. But you basically want them to feel good about what they just did and tell you what they just did. When people actually have to articulate out loud something that they did, it then burns into their mind. Hey, there's something I need to do. Okay, so now that's done. We need to do what? There's three more things that we need to do. In HB Pro, we need to do the report card. So the client needs to tell us how good of a job we did. And we need to provide a resolution to the presentation in HP Pro. We need to say what happened. I sold them this, they enrolled, or they said they couldn't afford it, or they want to think about it. We need to give a resolution to the presentation in HP Pro. There is one more thing that we need to do. Does anybody know what the last thing it is you need to do before, before you let the client go? Ah, I'll tell you. <laughs> You need to send them an email. You need to congratulate them in that email and you need to include all four items that you downloaded during your HP Pro presentation. So that's gonna be the AD&D certificate, the family information guide, the three important facts and the no cost legal will kit, right? So you have an email with four items. There is one more item that you need to provide to the client. That item is going to be number 20. It is the service folder for the United States of America. Okay. And it looks like this. Here's why I want you to include it. Normally, if we were in the home, we would fill all the stuff out by hand and give it to the client. They have this nice little package, but it's all virtual, right? So we need to give them this. And in here, it includes what? The freedom of choice certificate. Ah, so now they have that. You put your name down here, Samuel J. Sweet. Okay. The next one, conditional yeah, receipt. Oh, but uh, don't you have it open on your screen? Don't all of you have it open already? I have the solidification. Okay. So you now you need to open attachment 20, which is the okay. AIL Perfect. Globe member service folder for the USA. Okay. Okay, but I will share it because it's a good call. That's fine. I, that, I just kind of misunderstood what you were saying. Okay, I'm there. Sorry. Okay, so this thing should be open right here. And what you're going to do is put your name down here at the bottom so that they know it was you that gave it to them, exactly what you show them on HP Pro. Then the next thing is a conditional receipt saying, hey, I received from Joe Schmo the sum of $155 on this date, and my agent name is this. Basically letting them know that we're taking money from them. Okay. In the old days, it would actually be a check. That's what we would take, and we would give them this as a conditional receipt of the check. Next thing you need to fill out on this form is the summary sheet. Please, you should do this 100% of the time. This way, the client knows exactly what they bought. So you put their names up here. You put today's date. If you sold it today, you put in all this information in here. Okay? And then you ask them, hey, what do you like best about the program? You write that in on their behalf. What did you like best? Well, I like the Freeman Choice Certificate. I like the fact that if I don't die in an accident and survive, you're going to pay me some money. Remind people why they bought this thing. Powerful, right? If you remind me why I bought something, I'm like, oh, yeah, I totally forgot I bought it for that reason. I guess I will keep it for the next 25 years. And that means 24 years of renewal is coming to you. So fill out the summary sheet. Then the last thing is what comes next? You can say tomorrow your premium of 155 and just let them know it probably won't be tomorrow. It'll probably be three to five days, depending on how soon we can get to it, but it will come out. Everything else in the service folder is in the future that they may need. If you remember, we talked about changing uh, the date. You can put in down here in miscellaneous, change the date that the draw happens. Or maybe I have to address these policies and I'm moving. Give me a new address so I can have information sent there. My name changed. I got married, this, that, or the other. Hey, you know what? I now actually need to do the beneficiary for the trust so that my kids are taken care of. So I didn't get that done, but Sam told me about it and I went ahead and got that done. Now I need to change. Here's the key. Anything they need done, don't have them fill this out. Have them call you, right? Have them call you. 
so that you can fill it out. You're going to make money by doing that? Probably not, but you're solidifying your relationship with them so that if any other family event, anything transpires, they're going to call you and you can have the opportunity to sell them additional insurance. Because I guarantee you this, if they don't call you, they call me. What do you think I'm going to do, Ben? They're going to, I'm sorry, I was trying to pull up the thing. What, what was the question? Killing me. Yeah. If you yeah. a policy to a family and the family didn't call you back, but they ended up calling me, what will I do? Probably take the deal. I'll sell more insurance. Yeah. Right? Because I'm good at it. I'll find a way. To, and my point here is well, I'm a, your advocate. I want you to be the one to make the money. You built the relationship. So why not be you? So that's what I always tell everybody. Don't have them fill out. You fill out the form. Have them call you for anything. It doesn't matter. But they can look at this. They can have this information in here. There's the bank draft information. We already did that. So you don't have to worry about that. And then you have, hey, if I need to make a claim for an accident, basically use the A71. I have to put all that information in here. And my employer needs to fill this out here. And my physician needs to fill this out here if I was injured. And then last but not least, is the life claim, otherwise known as a death claim, right? Particularly if you get these, you want to be the one to help them fill it out because they'll never forget you if you're the one that helped them get through all of that. So this is the service folder. You're going to send this to them along with the other four pieces of information. And then you're going to say, hey, my name is Sam Sweet. I'm a third generation. No, don't say that. Say mm -hmm. such, and I really hope that you feel good about what you're doing today. Congratulations for ensuring that you're leaving a legacy for your family as opposed to a liability. I'll contact you in the next four or five months. We'll check in, make sure everything's going good. Uh, if we need to make any adjustments and add any additional insurance, we'll take care of that then. And now you're done. You're finished. Now, remember what I told you, 10, 12 minutes. You're going to move through this very quickly, particularly once you've done it a few times. Piece of cake. Melissa, what can I do for you? When you say like for the the folder, mm -hmm. so this is something that's sent out after. Like, are you going through the folder with them when they're on the phone, or this is something that you're sending out after? And then would you set put that information like in the body of your email? Like instead of sending in a form to change your beneficiary or change your address or whatever, would you just include that in the body of the email? Like, yeah, if you have any questions or any concerns, give me a call. I will. Uh, I will send this folder to them. I won't have them fill it out with me. Right. But I'm I mean, like the change of address and stuff, just please reach out to me if you need to change anything or sure. update That's anything. I would form, love to do that with you. All the things. forms are in the service folder. However, for faster service, just give me a call. And I'll take care of okay. it for you. Okay. So that's, right. I just wanted to see if that you'd normally put that in an email just to kind of encourage them to call you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. So you can see that the process took us two days, right? To get through, to understand all the pieces. The biggest problem that people have is in terms of filling out each uh, e-app is they make some mistakes about the sex or they forget about smoking or something like that. That'll be picked up easily. Don't be daunted by the fact that you're a field underwriter and you need to be aware of a bunch of things. You have access to all the information. It's in HB Pro, it's in e-app, and it's in the new agent packet. And if you don't know something, because it will come up, it will happen. All you have to do is ask your upline. That's it. That's all you have to do. Okay? It's easy. It's a piece of cake. I love it. At least in my mind. I like doing this job. I like teaching. I like. I used to love selling because I like the whole uh, impact. But it's not. This isn't difficult. I'll tell you, the difficult part is getting people to buy into the plan that you want to sell them. Once they agree that, yeah, I see value, yes, I want to go and spend $215, the rest of it is just processing. And you just got to process it in a way that it won't get kicked back or there won't be any errors. That's it. That's it. And people buy over 50% of the time. I mean, this is, I'm not going to say this job is printing money, but I want to say this is, I used to be a sales leader for Silicon Valley and a lot of different companies. I never built a comp plan like this, number one. And number two, it was never this easy to get paid after a sale because you're getting all the renewals, right? All right, do I have any questions about this? Everyone's got this, right? So who wants to walk through an e-app submittal with me right now? 
Look at that. Nobody's raising their hand. Everybody got this, but nobody wants to do it. That's okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Tomorrow, we're taking a test on EAP and underwriting. Everything that I've talked about in the last two days will be on that test. Now, it's not a test of pass or fail or a grade. It's simply for us us, that means us here, not leadership, not anybody else, us, to understand where we're at in terms of our understanding of our roles and where can I find the information that I need. That's all it is. It's a baseline. You'll get better. But we've got to have some feeling about where we're at right now. Does that make sense to everybody? Will, is that making sense to you? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break for 10 minutes. So come back, uh, come back at five, that's eight, that's five, that would be 13. Come back at 10 minutes after the hour, everybody. Okay, 10 minutes after the hour. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I love Barbara Wombacker's little, uh, what is that called? Is it a meme? Is it a little person? No, wait, it's not an emoji. What is it called? It's the little character. Anybody? Does anybody know what it's called? Bitmoji. Is that what it is? Uh, Bitmoji? What's that? Avatar. It's an avatar. Avatar. There it is, an avatar. Gotcha. I know Bitmoji is a little tiny one, right? But I love the avatar. Okay, so we went over uh, a number of things today in terms of underwriting and how to fill out HP Pro. You now have some ideas, but you need to practice that. And normally what I would do is take the next hour and we would go through and practice. However, we can't do that because I want you to watch someone talk about path to partnership, which is something on Friday I would have spoken about, which is as an agent, what does your future look like in terms of moving into leadership if you so choose to do that? I think it's important to hear from somebody who's been around for 20 some odd years, held every role literally in this company talk about what it means and what you have to do to accomplish it, things of that nature, just to give you perspective on what you can potentially do. Because any one of you could become a partner in this company. There's nothing that stops you. It's not your degree. It's not your college education. All it is, is it's your effort, <clears throat> how much you sell and how much you recruit. That's really what it comes down to. So I'm going to have you join the Dushai agency uh Zoom, and there it is in the chat, 848-4514-9430, and then the code is 2021. They're going to close all the breakout rooms, so everybody will be in the main lobby, and we can just listen to a gentleman by the name of Troy Plummer kind of walk through that uh, with everybody, and that starts in two minutes. So I think it's really important for us to get that. After that, you can go and do whatever you're going to do with your upline, your hierarchy, or whatever. And I'll see all of you again tomorrow at 10. No, we'll keep it the same. I'll see you all of you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Do I have any questions from anybody? Any questions whatsoever? No? All right, everybody. I, yes, we do. Melissa, what's your question? Are we going over at all the um, our A1? So I will do uh, specific A1s because I went and looked at all of them and I created a uh, email that I sent out that talks about the patterns and the themes that I saw. If you want your own one to have me look at it and give you feedback on it, just send me an email asking me that. I'm okay. Like Andrew did that or someone else did that. Niall, what can I do for you? Um, my only question was the video you sent for uh, day seven. It's listed as private, so I can't watch it. I'll fix that right now. Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate that. All right, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good night.